to bakkel hello everyone good morning to respected dignitaries honorable guest speakers teachers from all over globe and my dear student friends education goes beyond shaping us as individuals and enhancing our perspective it help us better handle problematic situation it can also help us from opinions on world issues and take us about the large community nelson mandela said education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world so this indicates how the education is important to everyone through this online platform botany for you we are trying to take a small step in the field of education in life sciences in yesterday's speech two things i forgot to share with you first one is that in coming future we are planning to organize online certificate courses in collaboration with different education institutes as well as research institutes at national and international level this will provide an opportunity to the students and researchers to access remote institutes through this online platform and the second one is we will organize one international conference every year exclusively for the members of national teachers organization in life sciences this conference will be held in different states of india every year today's technical session we will have four lectures of which one is pre recorded and three guest lectures are in live session the first lecture will be delivered by professor ma'am and daniel the second lecture by dr jitendra gaikwad the third lecture as per the schedule will be delivered by dr girish kumar rasineni this lecture is provided by him as a pre recorded and already uploaded and scheduled on youtube channel patni for you the title of his lecture is phrases and clauses of writings in science this is very important lecture for research scholars and faculties who are involved in publishing their research work and the separate link is already provided on our telegram group or even anyone can watch this lecture directly from youtube channel at the same time we have another lecture and it will be heard live session by professor laszlo zabdols from hungary friends on behalf of botany for you myself dr pitambar homne founder botany for you and associate professor and head department of botany dharampet mp dev memorial science college nagpur welcome you all on the second day's first technical session of two days international webinar and inauguration of national teachers organization in life sciences organized on 10th and 11th august 2020 it is my great play, uh, pride and privilege to introduce you with today's guest speaker who was awarded with lifetime achievement award in life sciences by indian society of solid state chemists and allied branches at international conference and with marthoma manav seva award 2015 the highest recognition from Sirian Christian Mathoma Church Kerala Professor Dr Mamen Daniel is a professor and ex head department of botany the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University Baroda Vadodara Gujarat and currently he is managing director for Dr Daniel's Laboratories Baroda Gujarat Sir did his MSc in 1971 from Fatima College Kolam and awarded with PhD degree in 1976 from MS University Baroda his area of specialization is taxonomy phytochemistry phytoalexins and medicinal plants sir is having spectacular 37 years of teaching experience and 49 years of research experience in his giant experiment experience he supervised about 40 msc projects and 17 phd programs and five major research projects presently sir is guiding a number of md ayurveda and msc student for their dissertation publication of 170 research articles with international and national repute are in his credit healing herb for use a book aimed at plant useful for beauty and health and amla an indigenous tree with enormous potentialities are the two popular books from his publication of 18 books along with all activities he was also adorned the post of life chairman faculty board member chairman and member board of studies in bombay member board, sorry board of studies in botany member research advisory and monitoring committee for botanical survey of india appointed by ministry of environment and forest government of india and also member advisory board navrachana university baro we have very honored to have 
such a multi-talented and multifaceted personality as a guest speaker to this international webinar. We welcome you, sir, in this international webinar. Sir, please, uh, you can start. Yeah. Sir, are you finding the share option? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, just below. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes, I have seen. Uh. Now it's fine. You know, you can see that. Yes, right? sir. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. you, uh, slide, uh, you can uh, make it as a slideshow uh, so that I'll uh, bring it on the full screen. Yeah. So uh, welcome all of you to this lecture. I'm very happy to talk to the teachers. And I'm uh, very indebted to Vidambar sir for uh, helping me to meet you and uh, share my ideas. Now, I was teaching botany for such a long time and that also taxonomy and chemistry and my most of the work was on chemotaxonomy. So I worked a number of plants on their chemistry, their affinities, and then shifted to medicinal plants. So after retirement, I, along with my students, started a pharmaceutical firm. They called it a Dr. Daniel's Laboratory to produce high quality and reliable herbal products. We have about 15 products now. Now, uh, I want to tell the teachers that botany is full of uh, scope. Say you turn everywhere, you see something you can do. And I'm giving you a bird's eye view of whatever you can do. So I have selected only five topics, herbal medicine, natural dyes, biopesticides, biofertilizers, and biofuel. Normally, uh, we do not teach these topics to the students. But all these come in your economic botany and utility of plants. And uh, you should get a lot of ideas. You now my topic is very long. See, for a, each one of these topics, herbal medicine, I can talk for about two hours, <laughs> like that every other topic. But I'm going to run through these topics. Now we come to herbal medicine. You know, people have doubt about Ayurvedic and herbal medicines. So Ayurvedic medicines are our traditional medicines and based on Charak Samhita and the earlier books. Now, there they explain the medicinal plant, they name them, and method of preparation is given. You will have to follow exactly. And every medicine like Chavan Prash or the Shmula Arishta would contain 30 or more plants, and they may be processed, and you can add minerals to that. And there is no concept of active principle, but the problem is that no new plan can be added. If you go for licensing, then you will have to say that you have taken the reference from any one of the old books. And if it is not there, you will not get permission. And uh, new scientific methods as that practiced everywhere outside. You cannot do it here, but you can uh, do it without telling them. And there are a lot of restrictions on food. Now, with constraints on Ayurvedic medicine comes the herbal medicine that is practiced all over the world. Now, you can uh, make a product on any plant. Now, it is evidence-based pharmaceutical trend that is practiced in Europe, USA, China, Korea, etc. And all these are based on the old book, Materia Medica of Dioscorides, published in AD 50. Now, a lot of um, research work is going on there on medicinal plant, and you can use any one of those knowledge or a uh, uh, grouping of all those knowledge. And uh, very important one is you should go for clinical researches. Now, only clinical researchers are uh, paying. Because every plant or every uh, medicine you prepare, they should be tried just like you know the vaccine trials are going on. 
So many of our plants have been studied extensively on patients in many laboratories. And you will have to select a plant in which maximum clinical researches are there. And you can add uh, antioxidant, antimicrobial, biocatalyst, immunomodulators, and there is no restrictions on the diet. Now, uh, we have a very rich heritage of uh, medicinal plants. And how do you make a medicine out of them? So the first problem is selection of plants. Say, I've seen a recent book on anti-diabetic plant. There are about 2,000 plants mentioned there as antibiotic. Now, which is to be selected? That's a problem. Then the biggest problem is adulteration of raw material. 80% of the material you get outside. See, if you start a business, you may be getting 500 kilos of material or 1,000 kilos of material. Now, they are all adulterated. Now, this is Kale Chopra. You see, he's a government scientist. Uh, he has measured that about 80% of the raw materials available are adulterated. And there is no improvement in extraction procedures. And uh, people do not worry about active compound. People do not know about them. So we have a problem to reach international market. And I have written an article in 2004 in Current Science. See the major impediments of India from becoming a herbal giant. It is because of poor selection of plants. You know, if you want to make a medicine, what you do is that you take a similar product from Dabar or Himalaya and copy. You can select the same plant, but change the proportion. And then you get a new medicine. And most of the medicine in India are prepared copycats. And there should be a question on uh, method of plagiarism there. Second is adulterated raw material. And third is inefficient extraction method. I'll be explaining all of these things uh, ahead. Then absence of supplement, then poor and unreliable results. And market pressure. This is the biggest one. See, you make a product and then the retailer wants 50%, 60%, or even 70% of commission. People ask me about 80% commission. They say, sir, those people are giving. So uh, the problem is there. Now, which plant is to select? Large number of plants are there, which is, is to choose. See, if you start an industry, select a plant in which there is a large number of clinical researches. And then it is proved. And then the method of extraction, everything is written in the uh, research papers. And you will have to follow that. Then have more than one pharmacological activity. And then you will have to see whether it is available commercially and whether it is affordable. That is a cost factor. Now, some uh, basic chemistry about medicinal herbs. A single metabolome, that is one plant all the compounds present in a single plant that is called the metabolome like genome proteome etc metabolome is the total number of chemical compounds present in a plant that will be about 4000 compounds and when you take a kada that means the extract this will contain at least 500 to 600 chemical compounds and now it is proved that you know do you one of the uh, very uh, big uh, Biochemist, he described the very common compounds like ferulic acid, genesic acid, camphorol, glycosides, uh, Spain relievers. Then, cinnamic acid, cumarin, mericetin, etc., are explained anti inflammatory. Then, you just see the amount. See, if you take coriander and licorice, dirty bar, they contain 20 chemicals with antibacterial action. And the amount liquorice contains 33% of bacteria compound. See these things, all these things you will have to take into consideration. Ginger contains 17 compounds, and uh, coriander contains 2.27%. Now, which plant to be selected? See, I have about 15 products. You know how I selected these plants, and that is why they are working very well. Now, based on the literature and proven clinical trials. And you will have to search literature, and that should be on 
correct botanical names. In case of change of name, earlier names should be used for literature search. Because if you use the new name, none of the papers will give the new name if it is published to be earlier and then conventionally used to plants. Then another question is, you will make a product with one herb or many herbs. Ayurveda explain polyherbal formulation. Now people tell me you add this, you add this, you add this. Now suppose if I take 20 plants for a formulation, each plant will be represented by 5%. So suppose I take Vidania as one of the 20. Vidania will be only 5%. That means the amount of compounds in Vitania will be only 1 20th. So like that, every plant is represented by 5% each. Now there will be some plants which are very active, some plants which are moderately active, some are poorly active. So what result you will be getting? I have uh, two, three products with one plant, two plants, three plants, and they are working excellently. So you will have to see the efficacy based on the clinical researches. Now, adulteration this is the biggest problem, biggest problem. I'll give you some examples. Now, see, this is Brahmi. See, in South India, they call Gotukola, Central Asiatica as the Brahmi. And in North India, they call the Koba Moniri, that is the near Brahmi. But everywhere, I have seen it. I have seen many places in many factories. You know, the Merimia emarginata, this plant that is with yellow flowers. And this is sold as your Brahmi. And this is only one kilo will cost you 50 rupees. Otherwise, original central Asiatica, one kilo will cost you 2000 rupees. And see the difference in leaves. A botanist can find out the difference. The leaf of central Asiatica is crystal clear without any spots, any other color. And, and another problem I find is Ashoga. See, I have a product with Ashoga that is called Femcare, an excellent medicine for any gynec problem, including menopause or polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I put original Saraka Indica bark in that. Now, I do not get Saraka Indica bark now. Now, all over India, they use Polyalthia longifolia that is called Ashopal. So people say that is Asho, Asho and Ashoga are the same. So Ashopal does not have any property. Some places they use Bohemia variegata, some places they use Shoria robusta, etc. Now I have stopped manufacturing my medicine because I did not get original Saraka Indica. I once ordered 200 kilos. Somebody said that this is the original Ashoka. And I had to cancel it because I saw the sample. And it was very fibrous and it was a polyalkia. And then Shangabushki. You know, you have four Shangabushki, Convolus chloricolis, Evolvulus alcinoid. Both of them are good. They are very good memory enhancers. But then Clitoria, Parajida, and Kanskora, they are also used as Shangabushki. I, I know that Clitoria does not have any property of memory enhancer. Kanskora, I do not know. Then another one, roots of hemidesmus, decalipis, ichnocarpus, cryptolipis, and all, but all of them are, belong to the same family. So the chemical constitution may be the same, ichnocarpus, cryptolipis. Then another problem is passion bear, you know, pathar todi, which can break kidney stones. Original plant is Burgundia ligulata, but at some places, Erua, Amania, Coleus, Glossocardia, Celosia, Akirandas, Scoparia. Now, people are using different, different plants. So their results will vary. We do not know. We do not have the clinical research data on all the plants. These are uh, passion bears. Then come to Gokhru. You are Tribulus terrestris. The green one, first one is Tribulus terrestris. Now, this is small Gokhru. And uh, right side is Pedalia murex, nota go guru, big go guru. Now these two are entirely different. Say the first one, 
tribulus contain uh, saponins now pedalium contain mucilages tribulus contain flavonoids go guru mota go guru pedalium contain flavones then there is another player in the field acanthospermum that is given at the end and then see the shmula you know that you are all familiar with the shmula but these 10 plants are never there in any of the shmula preparations of which the first five are herbs now i i know because i am now associated with industry they do not get the roots of solanum nigrum say solanum nigrum solanum xanthocarpum kandagari you get 50 kilos of roots when it is impossible so therefore they put the entire plant samula see the roots are entirely different from the rest of the plant so one is under down so if the legend shows that the shmula is very good then if the whole plant is kept what result you will be getting and then the other four plants are the trees and how to collect 10 kilos or 100 kilos of root bark you know it's impossible now identifying a tree in which a botanist can do it what i do is that in my factory where my manufacturing is done i told them that you show me all the raw material see without my concurrence no material will be processed i look to them if it is full plant morphology family character or if it's a bark or leaf i go for anatomy pharmacognosy and even i try with extracts with the chromatography then layer chromatography paper chromatography or if it is stem bark you can look for the color texture of the bark saraka uh, indica bark breaks very easily just like cinnamon while all the saraka bark i should get in the market they are fibrous they never break then the leaves then smell taste and any plant contain alkaloid will be bitter and if you have some more doubt you can look to the powder study you can look where you can see the glands trichomes multicellular unicellular and then uh, phytochemical analysis if they are all looking similar you can take the extract and do tlc now here uh, i want to present one of my book latest book published in 2016 with my son who is a phd in chemistry now this is sold out this is analytical method for medicinal plants by scientific publishers now they are coming out with a, a reprint of this one and the paper bound one costs only 355 the new one that is coming now and then this is an excellent book this is a book on tlc analysis you get photographs and this is a german book this costly maybe now 5000 rupees now where actual photographs are there now these are alkaloids of berberine say visible light uh, dragon drop uv light and all these things will help you whether your material is original or not see this i have just pasted see uh, i am using uh, terocarpus marsupia which is for my uh, diabetic product now it is a hard wood and my manufacturer said sir we got a lot of uh, this thing will you please check it so i just saw the texture of the wood and then i took the extract and i ran with the original terocarpus marsupium see the first uh, half of the one is the original one second is the test sample and it is exactly the same so that means it is confirmed and then the cost factor you know if you want to buy the raw material they will ask you sir aapko the best material chahiye but that will be costly kilo maybe 500 rupees and then you say it's very okay, costly that's... now now i cannot uh, uh, afford that then you say you take ordinary mal sada mal it may be 200 rupees and and if there is if you say that no no that also we cannot afford then they say that you take condom mal chalu mal that that will be a two year old material fungal infected rotten material with excreta of uh, insects rats and all that and people go for the second and third option 
Now, extraction method is another problem. You know, in uh, Ayurveda, they said you uh, boil them in water. At that time, the water was very pure. But now the water is very polluted. Now, uh, many a times, they extract only one time. That's not good enough. See, uh, if you take 50 kilos of material and put it in 500 liters of water, boil for two hours, only 60% of the material or the chemicals will come out. The rest 40% will remain within the plant material. So I told my manufacturer that you filter it out, put the residue 50 kilos in again 500 ml, take a second extract, again filter it and uh, extract it with another 500 ml. So total 1,500 liter of water. Then he said, sir, uh, how it will be very expensive for me to evaporate all this water. I said, I will I will pay for you. And uh, then the thing is that the first extraction you get 60%, second extract you get the remaining 25%, and third extraction you get 10%, 5% you will not get it. So this nobody follows because this entails a lot of expenditure. So, and another problem, which solvent, you know, I, I had a medicine for heart problem in which I use ginger and garlic. And I told my manufacturer this, you boil it in water along with Arjuna. So we had about 100 kilos of material and the total extract, we go to us only three kilos extract. So I said, this is, uh, you, can, you cannot afford it. So luckily for me, I tested that water extract for ginger rolls of ginger and sulfides of uh, garlic. Because in our uh, MSC practicals, we used to do practicals of ginger rolls of ginger and then I remembered that we extracted ginger rolls and sulfates in methanol. So I asked my manufacturer, we will have to extract them in alcohol. Then he suggested IPA, industrial alcohol can be used. So we extracted them in IPA and uh, we got 12 kilos of extract from 100 kilos of material. And I extracted that, uh, I tried that extract by TLC along with standard sulfides. It is 100% extract. So the products are excellent. They contain all the sulfides, all the ginger rolls, and all the compound. This, nobody does it because using isopropyl alcohol and then water combined, uh, you have to get uh, these two extracts, then only. And uh, Vitania contain uh, 30 compounds insoluble in water. And everybody boils them in water and take the extract. And uh, active principles, you should know, you have to test for. Then, uh, if possible, you can add antioxidants. Antioxidants are essential because now everything is polluted and our body does not have much of antioxidant because the antioxidants we have, they are fighting against pollutants or other contaminants. So the less antioxidant we have, that will result in oxidative stress. And that is the cause of aging and other diseases, atherosclerosis, stroke, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. So if possible, you can add an antioxidant-rich compound to your medicine. Then bioenhancer. See, piperin or black pepper. If you add with any medicine, the absorption of that medicine will be doubled. The activity of that medicine will be doubled. So that is biocatalyst or bioenhancer. This you can add to any medicine. And uh, uh, what I do is that if I get a powdered extract, I put 500 milligram of extract in one capsule, 500 mg capsule, which nobody does. Everybody says that my manufacturer says, sir, what are you doing? We are putting only 50 milligram of extract in one capsule and the rest for 50 milligram, we put plant powder. So that means I can make 10 capsules from my one capsule. But if you want to get good result, 500 mg extract must be there. Then bioenhancer is added, piperin is added, and your is added. 
adaptogenic plants are added like there are cyanide and above all what i say is that tell your student to be honest and faithful that will be the basic success story and this is about my my product and uh, when we used to give lecture we say that this is how i produce my product and then we come to natural colors there is the second topic now there are not many books i recommend these books natural dyes scope and challenges that is published in 2007 it's an edited book but an excellent book now it is being reprinted in 2020 or there is another book by me only herbal technology published in 2008 but that uh, i don't know whether it is available otherwise you can go for my another book useful herbs of planet earth and this is the book on natural dyes old edition this is the new edition this will be coming out uh, within maybe a month now synthetic dyes and pollution and if you just see the synthetic dyes and contribution to pollution you get 7 million tons of synthetic dyes annually produced of which 200000 that is 2 lakh tons are going waste are lost to effluence and these are thrown into water sea and all that where they destroy everything and uh, and the water with the dye will not allow uh, light to pass in so that will destroy the fish that will destroy the fungi and uh, a lot of and highly toxic are some are carcinogenic and destroy flora and fauna and many a time this water waste water is used in agriculture so that also and through agriculture you get in your body now about natural dyes what are the advantages see they are eco friendly eco friendly means they are biodegradable and that will reduce a large amount of pollution from the environment no uh, cancer production no carcinogenicity and many of them are antioxidant and many of them are antioxidant now Uh, the problem with the natural dyes is that you know I have many people working on this. Now, if you dye your cloth with natural dyes, after about uh, one year, you know it fades. They lose sheen. It is because the compounds present in them they decompose. See, you prefer natural dyes because they decompose. Now you complain that they decompose. Now you make it uh, permanent. you will be adding to pollution so because these are biodegradable you will have to dye clothes periodically that means you will be enriching your clothes with an additional dose of antioxidants then what are the compounds see you get proanthocyanin a group of tannins which on hydrolysis will give you anthocyanidin which are red in color there are many sources most of the bark wood they contain proanthocyanidin then flavonoids you know tea contain flavonoids our own butyria anthocyanins grape uh, uh, you are the onion quinones very many plants iridoids uh, for blue and green color alkaloids like berberine carotenoids like um, saffron now these are steps before dyeing clothes now this is only you see you have to introduce these things in your curriculum so that the students will be motivated so that is why i say that uh, let this be a guiding uh, lecture for you see these are the methods this is only for washing bleaching dyeing garlic aluminum washing and dyeing now there are different uh, methods for silk dyeing and cotton dyeing cotton is cellulose silk is a protein so there are different methods then you can make different colors if you mix red and blue you get purple violet lilac and lavender colors and if you mix blue and yellow you get green and shades of green if you get red and yellow mix it you get orange and shades of orange and black if you mix it with any other color you get brown gray drab maroon or brick colors now that is uh, dyeing clothes another big problem is food colors all the jams jellies toffees sweets ice cream stored food all of them are colored brightly by synthetic color 
people have a belief that you know no it's okay they do not have any harm but there is a limit mentioned there if they say that limit should be this much means above that it is harmful so if you can take replace the synthetic colors like sudan with a natural color i am showing some natural colors then pharmaceutical color you know pediatric syrup or other syrup tablets even the capsule is colored and that is by synthetic colors now if you put uh, natural dyes there natural dyes are many of them are antioxidant so they will impart antioxidant property say for example manjeshta rectagandan sapanwood etc will provide a number of antioxidant to any preparation for arjuna and sariva anything can be flavonoids will be strengthen your capillary walls reduce vascular porphyria and those endings will reduce cataract and then paintings you know that paintings of ajanta and elora that is by natural paints and they cost you know i have a, a friend come student in uh, faculty of fine arts here he uses only natural paints and his paintings are sold in lakhs you know the price uh, starts with 50000 onwards and he used to come and look for uh, dyes in a mile of water you can use manjeshta you can use turmeric if you use turmeric as a dye this will be fluorescing in the night also and they fetch a higher price in the market and they are eco friendly and paints see you are uh, paint that is used in your houses anywhere and you can use natural paints instead of synthetic paints now some example this is rectajandan tiroyarbus santalinus see we used to prepare lipstick out of it just take uh, ipi extract and uh, add to a little bit of wax and and this is uh, this gives a bright pink color and i produce a cosmetic cream called oxy care and this rose color bright rose color and the color is due to this rectajandan i add rectajandan only at the end we take ipa extract and add it so that it get lactocalamin color and cosmetics and face powder you can use you know and synthetic colors and the waxes which are used they destroy the texture of the skin and which in turn creates wrinkles and make the skin rough and if it is a natural dye that is there in cosmetics and you are remain your skin remain fresh because that is always coated with a supply of antioxidant now this is you know that beauty of frondosa people use it for uh, dyeing clothes or even as a holy color this is an excellent one some example there are about in my book at least about 200 plants and their uh, uh, chemical compounds and their dyeing are explained you better see that one then this is parijat you know there is an orange color flower uh, tube is there corolla tube this contains saffron you know the same compound that is present in kapoor and this is an excellent dye and then tea yellow color then this is rajma this contains 16 and then this can be a very good food dye or pharmaceutical dye and acacia babul tree the tannins gives a blue color you know that blue ink is produced by tannin with iron salts and then uh, eagle barbelos would give a dark yellow color then neem neem bark and leaves bark will give you a bright pink color and these are the other plants you know i have selected randomly selected few plants and every plant would contain a particular color sometimes you can even use chlorophyll and barbara sericata you know daru haldi this is yellow in color because of the alkaloid barbara and curcumin is another haldi then uh, wavding embly arabs this kind of benzoquinone red dye then amla amla you know with iron it will give you black color and terminally arjuna brown color terminally bellerga uh, there is no particular choice 
I have taken few plants. And this is about natural dyes. Then we come to biopesticide again. The book is herbal technology or useful herbs of the planet earth, in which a large number of biopesticide, including microbial pesticides, are mentioned. And these are the things. See, luckily for me, my daughter works in a uh, nearby university, and they have introduced project works and uh, curricula on biopesticide. And number of students are working on the biopesticides now. That uh, students from biochemistry. Microbiology, all of them are involved in that. Now, pesticide, you know, uh, it is said that mother's milk also contain DDT, pesticide. And all your food contain DDT and BHCs and all that. Now, uh, pesticides are very deleterious effect on human health. You know, endosulfan and all that, you know the history of that one. Now, if you see the classification of pesticide, microbial, botanical, pesticide, these are the two main groups. Now, microbial pesticides, are, you know, Bt, cotton and all that. Bacteria like Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus thuringiensis. Now, they produce endotoxins. See, if you spray them into a particular field, you know, the insect eating them will be destroyed because these produce endotoxin, toxin to the caterpillar or to the adult and the plant, uh, the insect dies. Then nuclear polyhedrosis, viruses, this is another type of viruses which form polyhedral heads. And this is also detrimental to many of the pests. Now, fungi like Bavaria, Bassiana, Candida, or even some of the algae like Laurentia or Plocomium are used as biopesticide. Then we come to the botanical pesticide. You know, more than 2,000 plants are known to have insecticidal properties. Now, fragrance, volatile oils, limonene, you know, from citrus oil, limonene and linalool, uh, they are used in pesticides, uh, as it is. Then, you know, the plants, you know, vacha, chorus calamus, and this, uh, people use it in libraries and all that to ward of the silverfish, then hit the soviolence, then root agraviolence, vetiva. And these are some of the examples. See, in my this lecture, uh, you know, I cannot do justice to all these subjects. Then iridoids, vitex negundo, then pyrethrins. That is your, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, good night, uh, muscular repellent, they contain alerthrins, a derivatives of pyrethrins. And they are obtained from Chrysanthemum cineraria folium, that is isoprenoid results in also an excellent insecticide. This is pyrethrum, and uh, uh, second one is the vitex. vitex. Then uh, garlic, garlic is a good pesticide, contain sulfide, mustard, and diterpenes like calme, croton, euphorbia, pedilanthus. And uh, another uh, group of excellent pesticides, there is your neem. And all plants in Meliase, Saimarubase, Quasiase, uh, all of them, they contain this special type of triterpenoids, limonoids and quasinoids. And they are, you know that they are used. Neem is used. Then saponins. You get uh, horse chestnut, Aesculus, Allo Agave Americana. Then you are Arak, Calotropy, Gigantia. And uh, nephritia, nephritia means basherum plant, hypomia fistulosa. Once, you know, one student asked me, sir, what is the use of nephritia? Nephritia means useless. I said, now I do not know, but I will tell you the use after something. Now I can tell them that this is one of the best bio pesticides. You see that colotropic gigantia and the right side is your hypomia carnia or hypomia fistulosa. Now, another group of excellent biopesticides are acetogenics. Now, they have furan rings and a lactone ring. They are hydrocarbons, for, see, 40, yeah, 45. And that is there in Anona reticulata, that is your custard apple, Ram Bhal, Sida Bhal, and Lashman Bhal. And they are also excellent anti cancer compounds. And then, if you come to alkaloid, nicotine is one of the best. And in Russia, they use 
the isomer of that anabasin, then FISO statement, based on the structure of FISO statement, they synthesize carbamate insecticide. Then uh, alkamides, that is your akmala, akalkaro. This is akalkaro. Left side is uh, tobacco. Right side is akalkaro. Is very pungent, one of the best insecticides. Then rotenoids. Rotenoids are the compound present uh, in duris and one of the best insects, biodegradable and harmless to man. And you get Pangabia, Malaysia, Duris, and Quirons, Indian Allo, Allo Barbadensis, Cassia Siamia. Then tannins of Butia, they are biopesticides. Lectins, lectin means glycoproteins. Uh, proteins combined with sugar. Then Jack Bean, Canavalia, and Sibromis. Papaya is having uh, another glycolipid. Castor, resinous. You know, the resinin, the protein is a lectin. And this is Canavalia. Then we come to the next to biofertilizer. Biofertilizer is a group of microbes that can be added to the soil which will uh, add nitrogen to the soil and to the host plant or phosphorus. Now, you know, fertilizer. Fertilizer, you know, now we are celebrating the birthday of uh, Swaminathan, Mr. Swaminathan, father of Green Revolution. Now, in Green Revolution, use large amount of fertilizer in the soil of which very few go to the plant and the rest chemicals they will be remaining in the soil they destroy all the microflora of the field and the plants they grow very fast if you give nitrogen more then it will grow very fast and long that means they are very susceptible to disease and everywhere when you use fertilizer you can see the plants growing very, very tall and like big, and then they easily get disease. You know, there is a they say that there is a racket between fertilizers and pesticides. See, you give more fertilizer, so the plants are more pliable to infection, and you can sell bio, you can sell pesticide. So uh, people are uh, uh, destroying this planet. Now, fertilizer, more than 300 million pounds of different chemical poison, that is fertilizer, are added in forms of fertilizer or pesticide. And Indians take about 40 times more pesticides than Americans. Then residues of pesticides, herbicide, affect the central nervous system. Now, that also cause depression, insomnia, and uh, bioclonus and hyperreflexia, etc. Now, some of the biofertilizer, nitrogen fixing bacteria, you know, Rhizobium, Asotobacter, Bizerinchia, Asospirillum, Frankia, or even some of the blue green algae, Anabina, Nostro, and Trolipotrix. And then phosphate solubilizing microorganism, PSMs, and, uh, you know, vascular, arbuscular mycorrhiza. They provide the plant with phosphate. And then we come to the last chapter, that is biofuel. Now, you know that now everybody is switching over to electric vehicles. So uh, there may not be much of a uh, need for biofuel. But still, I say, now again, the books could be referred are here. Now, if you check petroleum, and it shows optical activity. And there are porphyrin skeletons are there, aromatic rings are there. Alkanes are there. Then pristane, which is supposed to be formed from phytol chain. Pristane is C19 with a branched carbon. They show that this petroleum originated from prehistoric plants. And when they are born underground, under high pressure, and high pressure and temperature, and all those lipid compounds, they got segregated and formed the crude. And there are a number of petroleum substitutes, petroleum from plants, that is petrochromes, then vegetable oils, biogas, alcohols, biological hydrogen, wood and coal. Now, petrochromes are mostly lattice wells. 
lattice work contain poly terpenes that is rubber now if you can break them to smaller units you get petrol so there are a number of plants lattice beds which contain high amount of waxes and cutings like crustacea euphorbia caducifolia euphorbia lateris euphorbia nerifolia etc you can extract them and you get a crude oil which can be converted to petrol then the biomass conversion you know that typical biomass plant mass can be converted to 50% of biodiesel this is euphorbia caducifolia this uh, if you cut the branch and keep it for some time in your laboratory you get a thick cover of wax around that this can be used as a petrol substitute and uh, there are wonderful plants are there you know there are big trees uh, of capaifera capaifera langstrophy uh, and the wood in the center of the wood there is a big canal there is a big uh, cavity and which is filled with petrol like material and see that a tree of 90 to 120 cm diameter yields about 20 liters of resin within 2 to 3 hours and once you extract them then plug it close and then another 6 uh, month you get the same so you you can have see this is a diagram of that one these are the trees and people are extracting the copaifera resin and which is uh, full of hydrocarbon can be used as uh, addition to crude material then we have dichrocarbon turbinator that also is having a central cylinder full of resins which are similar to then kingiodon hardwickia pinnata now this also <coughs> this is in uh, south india especially in tamil nadu they are planting this in large scale and uh, a tree of 2 meter in girth uh, can give about 40 gallons of petrol like material and uh, sometimes you know people make a hole in this tree and then they do not close it and uh, the resin oozes out and that catches wildfire forest fires are there you can see these are the trees this is called anja and then this is a wonderful plant algae botryococcus brownii and now the cell wall of this contain about 95% hydrocarbons so you can culture them and uh, harvest them and put it in acetone acetone will extract the hydrocarbon acetone will not kill that so put it back into water and again it will produce a new wall and this is one of the most promising source second is chlorella so 50% of the alkyl mass can be converted to clear golden oil then vegetable oil and we already know many people have studied mostly jetrafa corcas calophylla inophyllum maduka indica and uh, aloe and balnetis roxburghi see i am coming to uh, closing my lecture and uh, two three one or two tragic instances happened in my life i tell you in this now this is aloe parbadans see aloe growing in saurashtra and kash they produce flowers fruits and seeds now these seeds you know the picture is there and below it is the oil and uh, second uh, just below is the biodiesel see we have asked for applied for patent now patent you know needs lot of money so we spend a good amount of money and then they have asked for revision it was in 2012 and i was retired so uh, i just uh, thought you know why to waste money and i came back and this is a good source of biodiesel then uh, another this is the tragedy you know balnate is roxburg balnate is egyptian the seed oil the seed contain you know there is the fruit there is a seed in the center the seed contain 45% oil and we conducted a workshop on herbal technology in biofuel and i along my with my students we have extracted oil from all different plant 30 40 plant and uh, found out the oil and we have seen that 
this bell light is is having the richest void so uh, this could be converted to uh, biodiesel now i reported this in uh, current sense in one of the paper and current sense you know the sentence that is written is recently the oil of bellnet is roxburghi has been disclosed as a suitable for the production of biodiesel that is in current sense a report on the national seminar on herbal technology conducted at the ms university of baroda and this is patented by israeli scientists and is an american better now the number is given there c wisman bordek hai and serena from bengurian university barsheba they quote this is what they quoted in the patent application that some fool in uh, ms university said that this is good for bio diesel formation and we are doing it and see this is my paper that is that has come in current sense and uh, at that end this was in 2005 i never thought i would make a patent and all that but now when i was ready for making a patent some smart person using my name he has got the patent then we come to biogas everybody knows or alcohol alcohol can be prepared from wood and ethanol any starch containing material can produce uh, ferment it and produce ethanol say in usa 1.5 billion gallons of ethanol is produced 1.5 billion gallons of methanol also is produced and these are mixed with normal uh, petrol and then the last is biological hydrogen hydrogen is the best fuel of the world but only thing is that uh, you do not get enough hydrogen and you just see uh, composition of water hydrogen and oxygen just see the fun of that hydrogen is the best fuel oxygen is supporting the fuel and when they combine it douses the fire and just like you know some marriages you know the boy is very sharp girl is also sharp and after marriage they become dumb just like that you know it is water is forming like that now you know that in photosynthesis uh light breaks water molecule in presence of chlorophyll to hydroxyl and hydrogen ions now there is nadph which accept hydrogen and form nadph2 but in presence of hydrogen is enzyme nadph uh, will not be allowed to take hydrogen the two hydrogen ions will combine and form gaseous hydrogen so you can simulate this one and produce hydrogen in large amount a lot many experiments are going on there now uh, hydrogen is is present in alkalex cenedesmus chlorella anabina and spirulina and uh, this is one of the best fuel i think people will be uh, people are a large number of uh, research laboratories are working on that and long with this i conclude my lecture and thank you for a patient hearing and if there is any question i'll be uh, happy to answer that you can see my website dr daniel labs and co to see my products my publications and how i make medicines you can contact me in my email and in acute cases in very urgent cases you can call me in my phone number or you can visit my facebook account mom and daniel or dr daniel laboratories and thank you hello 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 uh, can you hear me yeah yeah ha ah, yes if, if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer if there are any question any question please
uh, one question uh, was earlier uh, they are from uh, dr nikhat nakwi from <coughs> sms sms college nagpur uh, yes. are you working on bio fertilizer no uh, i told you no i am working on herbal medicines now say that is my profession now now i will have to now produce medicine and uh, more and more now i have 15 now and thinking of producing two three more so i do not have now time for that and my age is there you know i'm 71 now so i am not working on that but uh, there are so many agricultural universities are there they are working on biofertilizer you look to any publication and see uh, on biofertilizer and contact them uh, <clears throat> another one question is uh, saponins are poisonous sapon is you know haritha haritha it contains sapon but the problem is that saponin react with the skin of the insect and that will react with the skin of the insect and uh, uh, many other things you know water will enter into the skin of the insect or caterpillar so if uh, saponin is present so that means it is dangerous to insects so it can be used as a pesticide anyone yes. interested uh, from uh, online <coughs> session who is uh, uh, interested to ask the question to daniel sir uh, please or post your question in comments or they can um, send a question in my email or facebook I think I could finish within one hour. Thank God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so thank you, Vidambar sir, to giving me an opportunity like this, and I hope thank people you. got some idea as to how the students can be motivated. There is plenty of scope. Only thing is that our teachers are not keen on that. So uh, I hope that by this lecture will. give some insight to the teachers to make the subject more and more interesting there are plenty of opportunities are there you know herbal medicine natural dyes by fuel by pesticide excellent and you are saving the earth by doing so see the earth is now getting destroyed by pesticide fertilizers and all that and that is why you get more of these uh, parasites so if you go to this biological thing then i think you will be contributing to the sustenance of the earth and the climate yes sir okay. thank you sir uh, on behalf of organizing team botany for you an online platform for the students of life sciences and national teachers organization in life sciences i want to express my heartfelt gratitude to professor dr mamen daniel professor and ex head department of botany and managing director dr daniel laboratories baroda gujarat for his extraordinary talk with the audience in today's technical session of this international webinar sir is very enthusiastic in today in today also even after so many years of his retirement as a professor in botany he is very cool very familiar and real human i ever found in my life i have always observed him as my close teacher thank you very much sir for uh, sharing such a massive information on the topic of herbal medicine i will very uh, i will be very fruitful it, so, sorry it will be very fruitful and imperative for our students researchers and teachers with excellence your lecture will also play an important role to guide uh, research in the field of herbal medicine to all the researchers in and around the world thanks a lot once again for sharing time for us and given this opportunity to listen your research work i thank you from my bottom of heart thanks a lot thanks a lot okay sir thank you thank you thank you sir okay all the best uh now i request our uh, founder member dr deepak kochi professor department of botany sri shivaji college of 
Arts, Commerce and Science, Akola. To introduce our uh, second speaker, Dr. Jitendra Gaikwad from Germany. Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon to one and all, all the dignitaries, honorable guest speakers, respected teachers and students around the globe. On behalf of Botany for You, an online platform for the students of life sciences, I, Dr. Deepak Koche, founder member of this online platform, welcomes you all in this session of second day of this international webinar. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker for this session, Dr. Jitendra Gaikwad, an Indian, Indian born scientist working in Germany. Uh, in botany specifically from Mumbai University in 2000 and 2002 respectively. He did his PhD in Biodiversity Informatics from Marcus. Uh, he has served as a project assistant in NCL Pune, India. Also worked as research fellow and project coordinator in Marcus University, Australia. Uh, he had project associate with the Wildlife Institute of India, Ministry of Environment and Forest, Government of India. Dr. Jitendra has 12 international publications with uh, high impact factor. He has contributed in one book and two book chapters published by reputed international publisher. Along with this, he had uh, sizable teaching and academic experience. Also participated in more than 15 national and international seminars, symposia and conferences. Dr. Jitendra has awarded uh, many uh, fellowships and awards like uh, as an entrepreneur in science in 2019 by Falling Out Foundation Germany. Uh, for leadership skills in academia and industry workshop in 2018, uh, Indigenous Leadership for Sustainable Banksia Award in 2014. He is a recipient of Marcus University PG Research Fund in 2009 and also uh, awarded as Research Excellence Award uh, from 2007 to 2010 by the same Marcus University Australia. Dr. Jitendra is currently working as Head Biodiversity Informatics Unit, German Center of Integrative Biodiversity Research, that is IDIV, Germany. Friends, we are fortunate to have Dr. Jitendra as a guest speaker for this session. I welcome you, uh, sir. I invite you to deliver your lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, your voice, Dr. Jitendra, we are not able to hear your voice. No, no. Uh, keep wired one. Yes. Is it audible now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, uh, so thank you, Dr. Deepak Koche, for this uh, el elaborative uh, introduction. Uh, uh, so before I start, uh, should I uh, share my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, good. So uh, I, I would like to say that the first talk was really amazing. I'm still trying to absorb what Professor Daniel uh, presented in his talk. Uh, and probably um, 
the comment that I would like to make here is like he mentioned about two uh, issues uh, in his talk. One was the identification of the species uh, uh, so that you can pick a correct species uh, for extracting the uh, the metabolites or uh, the phenols from that. So this is something that uh, if he's around, then he would find this talk really interesting where we could uh, uh, demonstrate that uh, how biodiversity informatics can support uh, scientists like Professor Daniel in automatically identifying the species and not going through a long laborious process of uh, manual identification. Uh, so at, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank the founders of the Botany for You platform, uh, especially Associate Professor Dr. Pitambar Mane and Associate Professor Dr. Nitin Labane uh, for inviting me to present this talk. Uh, also, my heartiest congratulations to the organizers for launching the National Teachers Organization in Life Science platform. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, for the efforts to facilitate uh, knowledge exchange and skills enhancement in the field of life sciences. Uh, on the background of the recently announced uh, national education policy by the government of India, I hope you will find this presentation interesting and useful. Uh, so globally, we, uh, we have been witnessing a lot of events impacting human life, uh, such as the effect of uh, climate change, loss of biodiversity, increasing population, food security, mass immigrations, and technological and scientific advancements. Uh, especially from the scientific perspective, uh, we have seen a paradigm shift uh, in the way researchers conduct scientific activities uh, due to the technological advancements, such as the Internet of Things, high performance scientific computing, big data, and artificial intelligence. As compared to the past centuries, uh, life science is now becoming highly integrative and data driven. Uh, due to technological advancements, a uh, lot of data is generated using highly sophisticated instruments for which researchers now need new skill sets to conduct 21st century data intensive science. So for example, uh, data literacy and informatic skills to handle, manage and analyze high volume of data, particularly in biodiversity science. In the light of this paradigm shift, uh, through this talk, I would like to introduce you to a new emerging scientific field called biodiversity informatics, which is fast becoming a cornerstone of biodiversity conservation and sustainable development while taking the scientific field of life sciences to a higher level. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, begin with the status of biodiversity and the challenges that uh, needs to be addressed to slow down the speed of declining biodiversity, uh, followed by a brief introduction to biodiversity informatics, its scope, and its various components. Finally, addressing why it is necessary for the Indian students and teachers of life sciences to acquire biodiversity informatics skills in the near future. So as shown in the graph, we all are aware uh, that globally biodiversity is declining at a very fast rate. Along with the loss of biodiversity, we are also losing the ecosystem services provided by the biodiversity. But how bad is the loss of biodiversity and why we should be bothered about the loss of biodiversity and its ecosystem services. So as you can see here, only 10% of the species are known to science, uh, while the remaining is still undiscovered. It is predicted that by uh, uh, 2200, almost 50% of species will be lost without us even knowing what is lost uh, since it is not known to the science. Along with this, uh, will also disappear potential ecosystem services and resources provided by the biodiversity, such as food, uh, medicines, good quality air and water, pristine natural uh, areas and rec uh, for recreations, etc. Uh, so, why is it so difficult to protect biodiversity? So, 
biodiversity is diverse. Uh, there is an overwhelming diversity of phenomena out there. Uh, diversity of beings translate into an even bigger diversity of possible interactions of these beings, making things even more complex. And then diversity occurs over a vast scale that ranges from the molecule to the global level. So what kind of diversity we are looking at and how are the different kinds and levels of diversity interacted across the scale. So we are studying our system while the boundary conditions are constantly changing. As you all know, our test tube, uh, test tube Earth is uh, being heated up. Uh, for addressing this situation requires data intensive and big science approaches. Uh, also, depending on uh, what we want to investigate, the data requirements will differ, which adds to this complex situation. So, for example, to address biodiversity research questions such as uh, to determine how many and which species exist, potentially we will need taxonomic data, plot inventories data, remote sensing data. And then uh, for understanding why do species co-occur, uh, we would need species range distribution data, phylo phylogenetic data, and maybe fossil data. Next, to understand why species coexist, we will need functional plant trait data, phylogenetic distances, etc. And further, to determine at an ecosystem level how do species jointly function, the data requirement could be net primary, uh, primary productivity data, soil carbon inventories, remote sensing, etc. And finally, to determine if the species diversity buffers climate change, uh, we would need data such as climate models, land cover, and experimental data. Apart from the data requirement, a uh, big challenge is how to find, integrate, and use these different types of data for analysis and conservation. Some experts say uh, there is a deluge of data. But then why are we faced with a situation where pertinent data and information on biodiversity is not easily accessible and usable? So let's look at some of the reasons for that. So people collect biodiversity data in diverse ways, uh, such as field surveys, experimental, and using sensors or data provided by citizen scientists or crowdsourced. So there is a data collection, a diversity in the ways uh, uh, researchers or people collect the data. Then the collected data is in different quantities. Uh, as you see here, manually collected data is very less in volume as compared to data generated by automated sensors uh, and crowd and probably the crowdsource data. So there is again, uh, apart from data collection, there is a diversity of volume. And then the data is collected by researchers in different formats, types, and structures. So some would be collecting in an Excel sheet. Someone is collecting on in a Word document. Someone is using a text file. Some are using notebooks uh, uh, to collect the data. And depending on how the data was collected, the heterogeneity changes, as you can see here in, in this diagram. So those different colors represents the heterogeneity in the data. Apart from a uh, high diversity of biodiversity data, the other challenges are that the data is highly fragmented or distributed. It's not really centralized or uh, uh, in, in one place. It's really fragmented across different institutions uh, and countries. Uh, many times the data is trapped in non-digital formats in cupboards of organ organizations. Uh, so findability is a big bottleneck which leads to inaccessibility to relevant data and information. Further, the situation gets more complicated due to the diversity of softwares used for generating data and formats it is stored in. So even if you find the data, it is likely that it will be difficult to use or would be unusable. So to avoid the frustrating situation, what is required are skill sets for efficient management of biodiversity data and information, uh, which brings us to the field of biodiversity informatics. So biodiversity informatics is a developing discipline. Uh, 
a scientific discipline that works at the biodiversity science and computer science interface. Uh, it uses informatics tools and techniques to collect, uh, collate, analyze, and disseminate biodiversity data. As a result, in general, it is also influencing the research in life sciences. So during the past 15 to 20 years, significant progress has been made by many regional and global biodiversity informatics initiatives by developing high quality data resources, tools, uh, data standards, and making data publishing platforms available for conducting data intensive biodiversity research. So for example, number of uh, data resources are now available, which uh, provides data in standardized digital formats and are openly available, open access. Uh, these are just a select few uh, here. However, I will elaborate on few examples, uh, such as the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, Catalog of Life, and Atlas of Living Australia in few minutes to illustrate uh, the efforts that has been put in by the global biodiversity informatics community to make biodiversity data easily available and as a, and as a result facilitated biodiversity research and conservation. Uh, these are some of the informatics tools or softwares uh, that are developed for data analysis, visualization, data collection and annotation. So for example, uh, DYGIS and VAT uh, is used for analysis and visualization of spatial based data such as climate and species distribution. Uh, then we have BioCollect and EpiCollect, uh, which are mobile based applications for collecting field based species data. Then there is another uh, software called Maxed, uh, which is a species distribution modeling tool uh, based on maximum entropy statistical method. Uh, used for developing predictive speci uh, spatial distribution models. Uh, I will provide an example later in the presentation on how Maxent was used in a study that I conducted during my PhD in Macquarie University, uh, which we uh, where we integrated ethnobotany and species distribution to predict biocultural hotspots in Australia. As mentioned earlier, one of the biggest challenges is how to understand highly diverse biodiversity data and share it for various scientific purposes. So to facilitate seamless exchange and understanding of biodiversity data, both to machines and humans, data standards are required. Uh, biodiversity Information Standard uh, is an international nonprofit organization uh, consisting of experts from life sciences and computer sciences. Uh, which develops data standards for biodiversity data. So for example, it is something similar to the Bureau of Indian Standards, which provides ISI mark, certification marks on uh, consumer products that are made according to the Indian standards. Similarly, uh, the biodiversity information standards have developed several data standards for biodiversity data, which can be used for efficient exchange, understanding and interpretation of data such as the commonly used Darwin Core, uh, which is a list of standardized terms used to describe the variable names related to species, taxonomy, publications, occurrences, observations, sampling event, and spatial components. Then depending on the context of the data, there are other data standards, such as Audubon Core for multimedia data, then access to biological collections data for biological collections uh, in natural history museums and uh, biological collections. Uh, then economic uh, botany data for economically important plants. Uh, now ecological metadata language uh, is a metadata standard uh, developed by and for the ecological discipline. Uh, it is used to describe the data so that people can understand what the data is all about. So to simply put, uh, metadata is something similar to journalistic reporting. So it is data about the data. It describes the content, quality, condition, and other characteristics of data, which is useful for understanding the data. So metadata is of critical importance since it not only helps to understand the data produced by others, 
but if you create properly uh, you can also fetch uh, a high highly citable scientific publications based on your collected data set uh, this also serves the purpose of gaining incentives and credits uh, for the efforts that the researchers have invested for producing the data set so around 2010 and 2011 uh, the global biodiversity information facility data publishing framework task group uh, provided some recommendations in order to facilitate uh, fast mobilization of biodiversity data and provide incentives to researchers for the data activities that was undertaken the task group proposed a mechanism to publish data as a peer-reviewed scientific publications so it is similar to conventional peer-reviewed scientific publications but instead of describing the analysis or the study the data is described in short uh, it is a well-documented metadata which is nothing but information about the data apparently uh, from the same research activity potentially you can have two publications uh, the one describing the study and analysis while the other describing the metadata so many publishing houses uh, have adopted these recommendations and we now have a number of journals uh, which are into data publications uh, such as biodiversity data journals for the uh, which was the first one uh, we started publishing data articles uh, there are some more uh, like this so the another one is biota colombiana and then the next one is uh, the scientific data uh, from nature publishing group so on one hand uh, there are a lot of researchers publishing high quality data through these peer reviewed journals and making it digitally available for people to use but then there is a lot of legacy data in non digital formats such as books monographs checklist excursion diaries uh, reports etc uh, some of the publications actually date back to 17th and 18th century so for better understanding of biodiversity mobilization and uh, uh, providing easy access to biodiversity data and information is really crucial so to facilitate this and to liberate the data trapped in a lot of non digital formats a uh, number of global initiatives uh, were started so for example uh, biodiversity heritage library so it is a global consortium of uh, different organizations worldwide uh, such as uh, natural history museums botanical gardens universities and ngos who are making the historical non digital biodiversity data available in digital and standardized formats so through these initiatives uh, biodiversity heritage library provides now access to more than 58 million pages from publications published between uh, from 15th and 20, uh, 21st century so the topics these publications broadly cover are associated with uh, taxonomy species distribution nomenclature morphology phenology uh, ethnobotany etc uh, the next initiative uh, is the catalog of life uh, which is the most comprehensive and authoritative global index of species currently available uh, the catalog of life has the mission to catalog all known species uh, as an authoritative consensus taxonomy produced by the global taxonomic community uh, it consists of a single integrated species checklist and, tax, uh, and taxonomic hierarchy. The catalog of life estimates around 2.5 million living species on the planet known to taxonomists at present time. Uh, it, the, the catalog contains more than 1.8 million living and more than 63,000 extinct species, uh, which is almost 95% uh, of 90-95% of the species known to science. Uh, the another big resource uh, is uh, the global biodiversity in information facility uh, it, it is an international network and research infrastructure funded by the world's government uh, so a lot of different countries are participating uh, uh, in this facility and uh, it is funded by those governments 
uh, participating governments. And uh, so they have more than 100 uh, countries participating here. And it, uh, it is aimed at providing anyone, anywhere, open access to data about all types of life on Earth. However, uh, currently the most commonly available data through this facility is species occurrence data. And uh, hundreds of millions of records are provided using Darwin Core biodiversity data standard. Uh, the map here shows the special distribution of species occurrence data available through the GBIF data portal, uh, which is uh, provided by more than 1600 institutions located globally. So similar to GBIF on national level, uh, there is another fantastic data resources, a resource from Australia uh, called Atlas of Living Australia, whose mission is to promote and enable evidence-based decision making in all aspects of biodiversity and environmental research, uh, policy and operational outcomes. Uh, the Atlas of Living Australia is a collaborative digital open infrastructure that pulls together Australian biodiversity data from multiple sources, uh, making it accessible and reusable. It enables holistic understanding of uh, Australian biodiversity and is heavily used by scientists, policymakers, environmental planners and land managers uh, industry and the general public so for as an example uh, the use example i would like to show here is uh, is the is the one uh, the study that i did uh, the occurrence uh, so in this study the the occurrence data for the medicinal plant species used by the aboriginal uh, australian aborigines was uh, obtained from the atlas of living australia and gbif to identify, uh, the objective was to identify uh, biocultural hotspots in Australia and uh, look at the effects of changing climate on them. Uh, the ecological niche models for over 300 medicinal species uh, were developed using the Maxent uh, species distribution modeling tool, which we just uh, had a look a few slides back. So this was a highly multidisciplinary uh, study, which uh, spanned across different domains like uh, GIs, uh, taxonomy, ecology, ethnobotany, and social science. The outcome of the study was published in the Journal of Ecological Informatics, uh, as you can see here. If you're interested, just have a look at it. So uh, apart from those uses, of uh, 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 from the biodiversity publications and reports, a wealth of biodiversity information is available in the form of herbarium specimens. Uh, this is often an uh, overlooked area. Uh, the specimens are the underpinning of all biological studies. So uh, currently there are more than 390 million botanical specimens uh, stored in more than 3,000 herbaria worldwide. Uh, globally, uh, we are observing as part of biodiversity informatics initiatives uh, uh, there is a tremendous increase in the herbarium specimen uh, specimen digitization efforts uh, in a pursuit to mobilize biodiversity data for sustainable conservation so for example uh, global plants database provides access to 2 million digitized herbarium specimens uh, natural history museum paris uh, digitized around 4 million plant specimens okay uh, so th there is a lot of uh, uh, initiatives uh, which are investing uh, efforts in digitizing uh, naturalistic collections. Uh, all of these digitized uh, herbarium specimens are available via the Global Plants Data Portal. Uh, there are more than 300 participating herbaria uh, providing access to 3 million high resolution type specimens. Uh, on this data portal. Uh, with the advancement in technology and computational techniques, such as deep learning, uh, we are also seeing increased uh, in studies where the digitized herbarium specimens are used for scientific studies. So for example, such as these ones. Uh, the studies uh, are related to extracting uh, specimen level information and use of morphological characters for species identification from digitized specimens 
in limited cases quantitative morphological traits were measured uh, but for a specific group of species uh, there is a shortage of high quality trait data and the available data is fragmented and highly heterogeneous in nature so to facilitate uh, quantitative trait data generation from digitized uh, herbarium specimens and use it in understanding biotic and abiotic interactions we developed a tool called Tretex. So this is the user interface of Tretex, uh, which is available at the URL that's shown uh, below the image. And you can see here the, uh, the marked lift uh, with the red boundary and the values that were extracted uh, uh, from, those, uh, from that image for that leaf. So, uh, so uh, Tretex is a Java-based application integrated with image j which is another software application so in close consultations with researchers from the herbarium community and trade data users uh, we have developed this tool which is able to extract morphological functional traits associated with leaves uh, such as length weight area uh, perimeter and uh, uh, pto length the tool works uh, for any digitized herbarium specimen with species having non-compound leaves or simple leaves like lanceolate, elliptical, ovate, etc. Uh, the important requirement for conducting measurement is the image should contain a measuring scale. So uh, if you look at uh, all the digitized her uh, uh, specimens uh, on global plants, you would find that uh, almost every uh, image would have a scale present uh, as part of that scanning process. Now coming from global to the national level. So India is, a, uh, is, is an emerging, emerging economy and uh, it's a biodiversity hotspot and a mega biodiverse country where the rich biological diversity is declining at an unprecedented rate. Uh, thus, there are increasing demands from decision makers for reusable biodiversity data to make uh, sustainable policies. So natural resources have a high economic value, as we all know, and the challenge is to sustain it while promoting economic growth. Although it is recognized that the economic progress and health of ecosystems and biodiversity uh, are explicitly linked, uh, the economic forces themselves uh, themselves have become a foremost reason for biodiversity loss in recent time. So if mismanaged, it will become impossible to generate and replicate these natural resources and ecosystems that harbor unique and varied biodiversity. So it is really essential that we develop an informatics supported mechanism to efficiently manage and use these natural resources by recognizing it as our national natural capital asset. In this regard, uh, similar to other countries such as Australia, Costa Rica, and South Africa, uh, biodiversity informatics can play a crucial role and become the cornerstone of uh, biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. So in the NBIO report, uh, which we had developed uh, 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 for the Environmental Ministry, of India uh, and published in 2012, we had emphasized uh, the need for building a national information infrastructure, uh, which is necessary for developing countries uh, such as India uh, to make informed decisions about sustainable conservation of biodiversity. So through this report, we emphasized uh, the cause and urgency of digitizing uh, Indian biodiversity, especially uh, the biological collections that are housed in different museums, uh, organizations, and universities in India. Uh, I'm happy to convey uh, that early this year, the Environmental Ministry and the uh, National Biodiversity Authority of India has decided to undertake, undertake the biodiversity digitization project uh, by implementing the Electronic People's Biodiversity Register. Uh, through which Indian biodiversity will be documented from Gram Panchayat level to national levels. It's Pan India project. Uh, similar to every path breaking project, uh, we also have some challenges at hand to address. So, among them, in coming years, 
uh, we will be facing a lot of data and information management challenge. Uh, this will require attitudinal change, ability to overcome social, cultural barriers to facilitate knowledge building and foster data sharing mindset, which in main is uh, missing. Apart from lab skills, uh, life science teachers, researchers, and students who are data literate and have acquired informatic skill sets would be highly in demand, uh, not only in India, but also abroad. So uh, probably uh, uh, you would be aware that data is the new currency and informatics is the new tool. Uh, so I believe as we move towards a data driven science with great speed, uh, this is a good time to start upgrading ourselves with new skill sets, which will be required for future scientific activities and jobs in life sciences. So uh, I will substantiate this with uh, a study. Uh, in, in a survey based study by Springer Nature, they found that the scientists do not have good skills to organize the data, uh, which is presentable in a useful way. So most of the time, they do not have time to deposit data in relevant data repositories. And if they provide, uh, it is mainly submitted as a supplementary file, uh, which is of no use since there is no associated information available. Unfortunately, in spite of such a critical importance, uh, data management is the most neglected aspect of biodiversity associated activities. Many researchers lack data management skills and some think of it as a burden uh, while conducting scientific activities. Uh, so if you cannot present your uh, results and data in a useful manner, so think, imagine uh, how the policymakers are going to understand the science that you are bringing to the table. Uh, apparently, we cannot hold on to skills and mindsets of uh, 18th and 19th century as we move towards 21st century's data-driven science. So, In the recently published uh, Global Assessment Report by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, it is indicated that uh, there are data and knowledge gaps associated with various aspects of biodiversity. And as a result, certain assessment could not be done or are inconclusive. Apparently, this means our assessment and uh, management of biodiversity is as good as the uh, available or accessible data and information. So from policy making perspective also, it is important that researchers manage biodiversity data properly and make it available and usable for developing policies. So uh, in, in summary, to address these challenges, it will be crucial for life science researchers and students to acquire informatic skills to develop smart strategies for sustainable development. I believe uh, biodiversity informatics can take the field of life sciences to even more higher level by enabling researchers become data literate. Further, uh, researchers need to make data management part of their scientific lifestyle and national heritage activities, which will ensure a bio-based economy exists in reality uh, before it goes extinct. I once again thank the founders of the botany for You platform, uh, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Pitam Pitamba Humane and Associate Professor Dr. Nitin Labane uh, for providing me the opportunity to present this talk. And uh, also, my uh, I would like to thank my colleagues at the Frederick Schiller University, Ina and IDU, for their support. I also thank the viewers for their interest and uh, comments. If you have questions, then please let me know uh, by typing them in the comment section. Uh, thank you, and I, I'm happy to take your question. Uh, those uh, participants who, who are interested uh, to ask the question to Dr. Jitendra Gaikwad, uh, they can comment their question in a comment box. Any question, please, from audience section? Please post in the comment box.
uh, i think uh, there is a no any question in comment not at posted uh, just we have to wait for a minute so mm-hmm. that anyone ask the question dr jitendra i have got a question yeah uh, how can uh, we correlate uh, the biodiversity informatics with plant sciences animal sciences microbiological sciences can we uh, bring it together because when we look at there because in your phd studies you are try to bring it the plants and the humans together so can we, uh, how develop a tool whereby the plants animals microorganisms or 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 for that matter an ecosystem can be uh, studied uh, in a, in a in a informatics manner can okay, kindly throw some light on it but uh, theoretically yes it is possible uh, to do that but right now uh, the most biggest bottleneck is that uh, the use and the requirements Uh, so for for example if you are going if you need some kind of virtual environment where you have multiple domain uh, coming in together but you need to uh, figure out what would be the common ground because different domains have different uh, requirements and then uh, the informatics part is more about supporting to enable that collaboration or the analysis or the research that you need to conduct uh, in that particular environment so it could be developing databases it could be something uh, like uh, de- running some scripts or developing some scripts or protocols to integrate the data or clean the data run some kind of uh, automated uh, analysis procedure so this could be done but the, the basic foundation is missing right now so these are really an high on a very high level uh, but the basic foundation like uh, standardization of data uh, proper uh, uh documenting of data uh then uh, how are you collecting your data where are you storing so those basic foundational things are missing and that are the biggest bottleneck for developing those uh, high level virtual environments so that that's the basic thing okay. uh one question from uh, dr manoj bhiroria uh i maintain a pbr in our district sir uh, which uh, software used for maintaining this okay that that that's a good question so uh, i mentioned about electronic public biodiversity register so uh, the ministry of environment and the national biodiversity as as i mentioned have agreed to implement the e infrastructure to help them do this so what they probably would so what i imagine as a e infrastructure now is that there probably would be a uh, an mobile app which you can use uh, to document uh the knowledge that is there and the you do the usual pbr activity and that thing is getting digitized at the very same moment and it's transferred to a server and it is collected in one place so now what's happening with the pbr is people document it on a paper or in books and it goes somewhere in the cupboard so if I, if you are sitting somewhere in uh, let's say kashmir or delhi uh, you don't have access to that information although it is documented so we want to uh, move beyond that uh, by digitizing that whole process uh, and this is something will happen with e infrastructure of uh, electronic public biodiversity register so i would uh, 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 request him to uh, have some uh, uh, be on hold there uh, and look forward to that e pbr uh, uh, infrastructure coming soon in near future uh, but as of now maybe he can just continue uh doing what he is doing uh uh thank you dr jitendra uh ha, one more question ha. one more question uh, uh you mentioned in your uh, presentation that there is a need of a national biodiversity uh, 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 repository so uh, is that repository ready with india no. with, with the, in india or uh, it is still in the planning pro, uh, pro procedure it is still in a planning process uh, so the, so there are some uh, considerations at the ministry level on how to implement that and why to implement it so uh, it is just that it's a time consuming process but it's going to happen okay okay thank you okay thank you very much uh, dr jitendra Uh, also uh, i would like to share uh, with the audience that uh, on a various levels of research we are uh, discussing with uh, dr jitendra 
and he is ready to work even on an international level on the topic of biodiversity by informatics so that uh, we will have one another opportunity in india to do work with the dr jitendra uh, and in collaboration with the germany so thank you uh, uh, thank you dr jitendra uh, for thank such type you. of the proposal and your assistance and uh, cooperation uh, to our uh, online platform botany for you now i again request to dr deepak koche uh, professor department of botany so sri shivaji college of art commerce and science akola uh, to propose a formal vote of thanks to dr jitendra for the for his wonderful and uh, informative session dr deepak hello on behalf of organizing team of botany for you i thank to our guest speaker of this session dr jitendra gaikwad head biodiversity and informatics unit germany for sparing his valuable time for us and his very illustrative self explanatory talk and presentation sir you have explained a complex emerging topic in a simple way i am sure this will create a new insight among the listeners of this international webinar dr jitendra i thank you for your lucid talk here you exemplify how interdisciplinary research work is mechanized thank you very much hope we will work together in future thank you for being with us thank you thank you very much thanks a lot dr jitendra uh Thanks. now we have uh, professor laszlo from uh, germany uh, jo we joined with us in this uh, live session and uh, i request uh, dr nitin labhane associate professor department of botany uh, bhavans college andheri west mumbai maharashtra india uh, to introduce our uh, guest speaker uh, professor laszlo from hungary dr nitin uh, thank you dr pitambar uh, welcome hello everyone and a very good afternoon to all the respected dignitaries honorable guest speaker teachers from all over the globe and my dear student friends on behalf of botany for you an online platform for the students of life sciences i dr nitin labhane member founder member botany for you associate professor department of botany bhavans college mumbai welcome you all for the technical session of the two days international webinar and inauguration of national teachers organization in life sciences that is entoils which was organized yesterday and today is the last day in this last session of two days international webinar we have two eminent speakers dr girish kumar rasineni he is from hyderabad telangana has given a pre recorded video which we are broadcasting as per the schedule on the topic phrases and clauses in writing in science while laszlo shabados from hungary will speak on use of genetic technologies to identify and characterize stress related genes from higher plants dear learners i am indeed delighted to introduce to you both the speakers first dr girish kumar uh, resineni founder and scientific officer uh, saipen a professional writers group from hyderabad He has did his masters in biochemistry and molecular biology from Pondicherry University in 2005. Obtained his PhD in life sciences from University of Hyderabad in 2011, and recipient of DBT and CSR fellowship in 2000 from 2005 to 2011. He was a postdoctoral research associate at Department of Biochemistry, University of Nebraska, USA, from 2011 to 2015. he is an associate scientist r&d and flow cytometer department sanders life uh, science private limited hyderabad from 2016 to 2018 he is a principal scientist at tenet medcor private limited hyderabad india since 2018 to summarize i will say he is an accomplished research scientist experienced in proteomics genomics biochemical assay and method development He has published more than sixteen research publication, three book chapters, and a regular scientific blog writer. I hope his insight will definitely help everyone. And I will say we are all fortunate to have him on this platform, Botany for You, for uh, learners of life sciences. Now, this particular lecture will be broadcasted at exactly at one p.m. as per the schedule. The uh, 
the second regarding the second speaker dear learners i am indeed privileged to introduce to you all one of the finest researcher from hungary he is professor laszlo shabados he is the group leader of arabidopsis molecular genetics institute of plant biology biological research center hungary he did his doctoral phd in biology from university of szeged in 1982 he was awarded doctor of uh, hungary academy of sciences that is bsc in 2010 Before joining BRC in 1998, he did his postdoctoral fellowship biotechnology research unit from Columbia from 1984 to 87. He did his second postdoctoral fellowship in Max Planck Institute, Germany. He joined as research associate Institute of uh, Plant Biology (BARC), BRC, Szeged, Hungary. Uh, TA, TDNA insertion mutagenesis in uh, Arabidopsis in 1990 till 1997. <clears throat> Since 1998, he is the senior research associate. and group leader institute of plant biology brc shaged uh, in 2005 and 2006 he joined as a senior uh, hai sf fellowship university of california riverside uh, california he is a invited faculty at france and argentina he also worked as a consultant for bears crop research uh, crop sciences belgium for 2 years he is member of highly acclaimed bodies of european uh, federation of biotechnology International Association of Plant Biotechnology, American Society of Plant Biology, Association of Hungarian Genetists, Hungarian Society of Plant Biologists, etc. He has world over collaboration with at least ten different countries. Uh, today, I am one of the uh, under his able guidance. More than twelve students have awarded PhD, and many students has undertaken ITC training and diploma under his able guidance. i am one of the fellow who did his postdoctoral training under his able guidance he has around 84 publications of international repute and two patents his cumulative impact factor is around 242 that's a, that's a huge huge amount and he is having around 4000 citations and h index of 29 his field of research is gene tagging in arabidopsis development of gene identification method regulation of uh, salt and uh, drought resistance stress related signal transduction we are very really highly honor, honored to have you with us today laszlo and definitely everyone will get get benefited by your vast experience we welcome you to this international webinar over to you laszlo thank you very much dr nitin uh, welcome dr uh, professor uh, laszlo uh, to this uh, online platform botany for you and on uh, so uh, we are requested you to deliver your lecture okay thank you for this uh, nice introduction and uh, i am happy to uh, help and then collaborate in this international seminar and, and today i after some discussions i am going to talk about uh, an area what uh, we are pursuing In, uh, in web and it is not just our or research but it is a type of uh, approach to to deal with uh, uh, problems in in, uh, in environmental stresses so i will try to share this uh, um, So, is it visible the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, visible. Okay. So, I'm I'm going to talk about environmental problems, but. Uh, is more from a um genetic and molecular point of view um and starting with this this slide what i i took the, the photo in uh, in israel in the negev this uh, that that is, is i think is familiar in many parts of the world that um there is no enough um water or it's ex extremely high or extremely cold temperatures and uh, and the soil degradation which is 
is uh, regarded as an extreme environmental condition, and it needs special adaptation for the plants. I'm not going to talk about much uh, agricultural problem. I think it is uh, often it's more economical and, and social problem, but more from a point of view of, of the plants, how they can deal and what we can understand it. Um, so um, extreme environments are, can be found in, in a, around half of the globe. Um, one is, is the problem is, is drought, but it means that there is no enough water. Uh, it seems that this uh, condition is, is more and more serious in, in this uh, environmental change that we, we are facing now. It's not just the high temperature, but the associated drought, which uh, um, prevents, uh, of course, uh, efficient agricultural practices, but it's also mean a type of uh, change in 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 the in, uh, in the climate, which makes uh, conditions more and more unpredictable. In the high temperatures here in Hungary, we can uh, already see that uh, the winters are not as cold as as uh, as before. There are um, due to the mild environment uh, there are invasive species uh, not just plants but uh, insects mosquitoes and uh, and and uh, other species which were not really common in in this uh, area and that that can go on the other extreme is the cold when there are extreme colds which is uh, seems to be diminishing this danger but uh, Apparently, the danger is, is, is not just it is cold or heat, but it is uh, more extremes are more common. And uh, one, one uh, consequence of, um, of lack of enough water is, is that soils can be degraded fast. Even if irrigation is taking place, then uh, soil salinity can increase. I am not a soil scientist, but uh, Probably you know the story of Mesopotamia that uh, they have developed an efficient uh, irrigation system three, four thousand years ago. But due to the intensive irrigation, the soil started to be more saline and saline. And according uh, to some archaeologist surveys, uh, the end of the Sumer and Mesopotamian culture was partially uh, the cause of uh, extreme salinity of the soil which was was building up at that time. And nevertheless, there are plants which can grow in such environments in a, uh, and they are categorized as extremophile plants, uh, like the one I am showing now. This is a, a cruciferi plant uh, called Lepidium crassifolium. It is uh, uh, it can be found in, in Central Europe. Uh, I think also in West in Central Asia, and this this plant can grow in in areas where there is really high concentration of soil. You can see it is salt is precipitated. It is a mixture of different ions, and the plant is still growing, flowering, setting seeds. So we can understand a lot uh, how they, they, this plant uh, thrive in such conditions, and pr probably consider them as, as soil source of, of uh, diversity of genes. Okay, after this introduction, I just would like to summarize very shortly what plants feel when there is, uh, and how they try to respond when uh, uh, conditions are optimal. So if uh, a number of effects uh, are disadvantages to plants, it, here in this, in, this, in this figure there is uh, uh, ozone, which is an oxidative agent, extreme temperature, I mentioned flooding, which prevents uh, uh, proper uh, respiration of the plants and, uh, and uh, can generate anoxia, um, drought or salinity, I, I mentioned. So, and somehow recognize that something is growing wrong and some uh, such effects they already know something about uh, the sensors or the mechanisms which senses 
others are really known well. And then there is a signal tra transduction mechanism which prepares uh, the cells or, or the organism to cope somehow to this disadvantageous uh, situation. The result is usually changes in, in uh, metabolism and uh, changes in, in development and physiological processes. So, um, what plants, how plants respond? One of the things is that they try to avoid uh, the stress conditions. So, so they, they, for example, in, in uh, water, uh, if there is no enough water, a number of plants simply try to uh, grow their roots faster and, and there's still some water. The other is, is uh, uh, the other strategy uh, is the tolerance that uh, they, the plants try to survive and uh, somehow grow or at least survive in a certain period of, of high temperature or drought or such things or adapt uh, to a certain degree and tolerate uh, this uh, stress conditions in, uh, in, in individual population uh, level. The, the, this can be uh, connected to acclimation that uh, adjust uh, the capacity of uh, individual plants to tolerate uh, stress. And of course, um, the response can be also that the plants don't are not able to cope with with such extreme conditions, and uh, they they died, and they they uh, either then in some cases they have a type of accelerated death, but or, or simply, uh, for example, they dehydrate and die, or or high temperatures they they can uh, die. So then there can be a number of different consequences of these uh, extreme conditions, um, and also um, the chances of the plants. And the mechanisms that they use, it, it depends on the type of stress. Uh, depends how severe this this stress is, how high is really the temperature, how long it takes. Um, a few, uh, one hour of, of high temperature is maybe it doesn't, uh, let's say, 40 degrees to uh, plants which are accustomed to uh, lower temperature. Is, is not letter, but if it is taking place for longer time, then the duration, then, then it, it uh, really reduces viability. Uh, again, it is a question of uh, if uh, the type of stress is, happens once or it is repeated. A certain repetitions can prepare the plants to, to withstand certain, uh, the next step of, of stress. So even different stresses can be used for acclimation and so that and the combination of stress so usually uh, the problems doesn't come alone if there is not enough water it can happen that it is uh, combined with high temperature or low temperature or extreme freezing conditions uh, excess of uh, salt in, in the soil can Build up if uh, in in the case of uh, drought conditions. So the combination of stresses uh, can affect also the plants. And usually, it is not just summing up uh, different condition effect of different conditions. It is a type of extra uh, stress. Uh, for example, high temperature, high light, uh, and high temp and, and uh, lack of water. That that is really extremely dangerous for the stem plants. And then the plants can, can uh, depending on the capacity to respond, they can build up a certain degree of resistance. Uh, they can, if not, they, they, can, uh, uh, they can die. Uh, with the resistance, they can either survive just without growing or in, if uh, death conditions are not so severe, then they still maintain growth or they can able to flower. Um, accelerated flowering is, for example, one of uh, the typical response in arid regions that the plants flower very fast. So uh, there is a great vari variability of, of these responses. So if we 
see most of the plants, uh, what is the consequences of such stresses, um, we can summarize uh, in, in, in at least point to certain changes. One is what is typical that the plants stop growing. That is, uh, cell proliferation, cell division is usually one of the most sensitive uh, uh, metabolic or, or more sensitive uh, physiological processes and then plants they, they stop. Uh, photosynthesis is also quite sensitive. Um, um, in in uh, extreme conditions often the photosynthesis is affected, the quantum yields and, and the car and the carbon fixation is reduced, so there is less energy for the plants uh, as a consequence. Um, probably everybody knows that in lack of water, the stomata, uh, stomata they close, so to have to keep water and and, and keep uh, from evaporation, but that affects also photosynthesis. In the case of salinity, changes in homeostasis. That is uh, one of uh, the most typical thing and the uh, um, ratio of sodium and potassium is, is uh, quite sensitive for most cells. So, so in case of salt stress the plants try to keep this ratio uh, as much as they can and if it, this balance is, is fine, then that can be very harmful. Um, usually there are a number of hormones which uh, the hormone content changes. The most typical is uh, ABA, abscisic acid, and ethylene. They are typical stress hormones uh, in a different. They fun function in a different way. And if we go to the molecular level, then you can observe quite large uh, changes in uh, gene expression patterns. Hundreds or thousands of genes uh, work in a different uh, um, efficiency or different way if if stresses happen. And as a result, uh, um, in in uh, pro protective proteins or, or metabolites can be accumulated, which can help the plant somehow in, in cellular level to survive. And a, and a consequence, um, in practically all changes, is uh, the reactive oxygen species are accumulated, uh, which uh, can come from photosynthesis but can, uh, from chloroplasts, but can come from mitochondria and peroxisomes also. And they represent a secondary stress and uh, can lead to cell death. So these processes you can keep in your mind that can happen and, and takes place and plants try to cope somehow with them. And how to study them? Uh, the aerovidosis is the most uh, commonly used model and all these processes uh, has been mo most extensively studied in abidosis. It is actually a useless plant is agri from an agriculture point of view, but it is easy to handle. Is, is the genome uh, has been determined as the genome sequence first in uh, all plants. And if we, uh, for example, expose plants to salt or draw stress, we can uh, uh, study in, in these plants the most important responses as in other other species. So uh, drought and salinity uh, generate autotic stress, uh, salinity can uh, generate ion toxicity also, mostly for due to sodium or, or chlorine ions, and the secondary stress, the oxidative stress, takes place in both cases. So as a result, in, in these plants you can observe also that growth uh, and cell division photosynthesis is reduced and the plants uh, switch on certain type of defenses in, uh, in a molecular or cellular level. And one of them is, is uh, uh, osmotic adjustment or, or trying to detoxify reactive oxygen species, uh, which has been studied extensively in this plant. Uh, now I switch a little bit technically to a uh, different topic because transformation is, is uh, something essential uh, to study gene functions and and, uh, and study uh, what is taking place in, uh, in the plants and in a number of different ways and just try to describe you uh, what is the mechanism what we use and uh, what is the most common uh, things that uh, this technology can um, 
of her. So if um, genetic transformation means that uh, introduce a piece of DNA, a gene or a fragment of gene into a species, it can be a plant or microorganism or even animals. Uh, in case of plants, there are two commonly used methodology. Uh, one is the physical transformation when a gene gun is used with uh, gold or some other heavy metal particles covered with DNA and they shot into the uh, with physical force to plant cells, uh, entering DNA into the plant cells and then they try to select and regenerate plants from this uh, cells which has been um, uh, treated with this uh, uh, particles. The other way, which is uh, probably the most common and easiest, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, is the agrobacterium-mediated gene transfer, as uh, agrobacteria is a, is a natural bacteria which has the capacity to introduce genes into plant cells, and uh, after, after modifications, the agrobacterium uh, vectors are introduced uh, when, when these modified strains are, are infected again, um, modified cells are generated, which are selected for the introduced uh, <coughs> gene or, or gene markers uh, with, with certain selection procedures and plants are regenerated. So the agrobacterium is actually a, a pathogen in living in a, in a, is a gram-negative bacterium living in a soil and it can generate tumors in, in different uh, plants, for example, in, in grape, depending on the strain. In grape, it's, it's, it's a problematic uh, issue. And, and this uh, bacteria can attach to the cells and can introduce genes into the cells. So this is a type, it has a natural uh, transformation process process. Each agrobacteria, depending on the strain, there can be uh, variation, has a, a so-called tumor inducing uh, plasmid, TI plasmid, and the portion of this plasmid is induced, introduced to uh, plant cell. So, um, the, but the, but the agrobacteria uh, recognize lesions uh, in plant tissues and, and are activated uh, <coughs> tumor induced genes <coughs> in the TI plasmid are activated, and the so called tDNA transfer DNA <coughs> is um, transferred into the plant and it's introduced into the nucleus. And if this Y type bacteria uh, is functional, then this cell starts proliferating because the tDNA carries some oncogenes which are uh, producing uh, division related hormones like auxins and cytokines or make the cells more sensitive to such stimuli and the result is, is a tumor, is a oncogenous type of cell proliferation which in the case of agrobacterium tumor patients is called prongor. And uh, this <clears throat> type of transformed tissue can grow without external hormones, so that is a characteristic. Uh, this mechanism is already known, <clears throat> the most important steps at least. So the TI plasmid has this tDNA which is transferred to the plant cell. Uh, uh, the other important region of this plasmid is uh, virulence region and this can be separated. And the tDNA uh, is is formed is a complex is formed with uh, some virulence type of proteins. It is <coughs> two cells are connected and introduced into the uh, this complex into the plant cell, where uh, the import mechanism of uh, nuclear uh, nuclear import mechanism of the plant cell is introducing this piece of DNA into the uh, cell nuclei where it is integrated in a more or less random way into the chromosomes. So then uh, the integrated uh, DNA is functional and the genes 
where they are functioning. So then, then it is is transmitting to the next generation. So this is a natural transmission system. How this can be used to make plants <clears throat> transform? Okay, there are this this oncogenic. This is a general scheme of a T plasma, uh, and the tDNA region is uh, uh, bordered by two repetitive sequences, the so-called left and the right tDNA border. So these borders are important to, to have because bit, what is between them, that is transformed into the, into the cell. But we don't need oncogenes. We don't need actually the rest of the tDNA because they are, uh, these genes uh, are responsible for the tumorous proliferation of the transformed cells. So they can be eliminated and they can be replaced by other, uh, other genes or DNAs. And the other important thing is, uh, is uh, the virulence region, because this virulence region of the TI plasmid is, is coding proteins which can dissect this uh, fragment can, uh, and are responsible for protection and, and guidance of the DNA into the plant cell. So that is, that is essential. The, the borders are essential, but what is actually in the tDNA, it is not really important. So the foreign genes and markers can be into instead of uh, these oncogenes. Um, this uh, uh, type of vectors has been constructed in the 80s, but then later they, they recognized that it is actually not necessary to put these uh, foreign genes into this large plasmid that they can be placed in a, in a separate vector that is called the binary vector system, which is easy for handling in, in, to, in, in a lab uh, for cloning. And uh, this uh, so-called disarmed TI plasmid can be used in uh, bacterium stream, but then afterwards they don't, you know, we have, don't have to deal with them. So typical TI, uh, typical transformation vector has a left border, right border, can be uh, maintained in Escherichia coli, in, uh, can be maintained in uh, agrobacterium and has uh, usually a marker, some selecting marker in uh, uh, usually antibiotic uh, resistance in, and the foreign gene. So today, a number of uh, vector systems are available, which can be used for transformation, uh, having different type of uh, selective marker genes, enamycin, hygromycin resistance, or, or phosphonatricin or glyphosate, which are herbicides can be used in, in greenhouse also. The different, uh, depending on the origin uh, the, uh, of this vector can, can have uh, different type of cloning sites, it can be classical restriction sites or gateway or combination sites to introduce new vectors, uh, new genes and so on. So that is that is a general uh, scheme someone can find usually in all binary vectors. Okay, if we have uh, cloned genes with uh, such agrobacterium, how we can generate plants? Uh, the most common and first uh, this guy method is so-called leaf disk transformation. When people was in the 80s using uh, pieces of leaves uh, and, and mixed with uh, appropriate agrobacterium strain, and then in after certain cultivation in a selective medium, uh, they eliminated the agrobacteria. They produced scalus or they produced directly regenerating shoots from this infected uh, leaf pieces. And then uh, 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 shoots could be rooted and, and uh, transformed from plants regenerated from them. So this type of strategy is used in, in many plants, uh, sometimes uh, not uh, leaf, but root sections or embryos or, or different, depending on, on the plant species, uh, type of tissue is used, which is, uh, able to regenerate plants. So, so it is an example for the tobacco. If you see in the absence of cannabis, in, in this case, cannabis was used as a selection marker. Uh, and when tobacco leaves were put in regeneration medium, you can observe a number of small 
all shoes after a few weeks, uh, regardless if these leaves were infected with agrobacterium or not. In the presence of canamycin, in the control plate without agrobacterium, the, the leaf pieces uh, died, or if the agrobacterium say no uh, binary vector. But if we, if the agrobacterium had a canamycin resistant carrying a vector, you can find a, a few sh green shoots uh, starting to proliferate from the leaf. So they are transformed. So this is usually the mechanism what uh, uh, is most. The other possibility is you using so-called implanter transformation with epidopsis, and that is uh, a very efficient way of transforming plants because it doesn't need uh, in vitro plant regeneration. Just mass the flower inflorescence of the flowering Arabidopsis plants into agrobacterium, uh, keep them in a humid place for two or three days, then collect the seeds, uh, germinate the seeds in it can be in soil if the marker is such, then you can generate thousands of transgenic plants without any in vitro tissue capture procedure. Unfortunately, this this uh, uh, technology is not available for most plants. Is uh, some people is trying to adapt to other species, but uh, apparently it is most uh, efficient in the case of Arabidopsis, and that is the reason why Arabidopsis uh, became also uh, model because very efficient transformation allowed generating thousands or millions of transgenic plants. So what we can do. Uh, uh, what, what transformation offers for investigation or what can technology genetic uh, modification technologies uh, either for investigation or biotechnology uh, if you just see uh, a native eukaryotic gene uh, plant gene you can see that um, it has uh, five prime regulatory sequence promoters exons, uh, uh, 5 prime, 3 prime UTR, uh, untranslated region, exons, introns, and the uh, uh, promoter is defining how the transcription takes place, and the result usually is a, is a protein. So that is the classical, very much simplified uh, way. Um, the most or very common transformation aim is to enhance uh, expression. So. Uh, people is changing uh, promoter to uh, uh, a much more stronger promoter, usually of viral origin, and the result is is uh, to produce more proteins than uh, this gene otherwise would pro produce, and and see what uh, phenotype this this producing plants can. Um, the cDNA or, or the encoded protein can be modified, so. The result in this case can be a modified protein, and that depending on on the purpose of of the work, so this can be uh, connected with certain uh, modifications. The uh, the other direction is uh, gene silencing. When we try to suppress the expression of the native gene, there are several technologies. Uh, the result is is uh, less protein or no protein at all. And usually, this suppression is not. Under the person, so there is uh, often residual. Uh, the similar can be the effect of the insertion, the TDNA insertions or transposons, but they can produce really knockout genes, eliminating completely the function of you know, the affected gene. So the gene product is can be missing in this case. Uh, a new technology uh, which became popular in the last few years is the genome editing when we modify certain part of gene with targeting, and then the result is, is a engineered protein with the minor or bigger or smaller changes. And there are, uh, one of the interesting applications of transformation is, is to test the promoter uh, functions. In such case, the promoters are fused to a reporter gene uh, which can produce light or can be stained. Uh, and so Glucuronidase or luciferase gene. So this, these uh, tools are available, most uh, not only for Arabidopsis, but in Arabidopsis is is the most easy to use them. 
And, uh, and if we want to uh, study genes, the classical way is, is, uh, is using genetics. For the genetics, we need genetic variation. The genetic variation can be identified in, uh, so again, um, a native plant gene with a promoter, exons, introns, transcribed region. Uh, but um, if we collect plants from different parts of the world or, or different populations, usually we find small modifications. So natural polymorphism is, is always there and uh, is, is uh, uh, now a very important tool to, to see if certain variation associated with certain polymorphisms and identify the molecular background of that. Um, variation can be, of course, induced by mutagenesis, can be point mutagenesis with, uh, for example, atimatase sulfonate, or can be uh, physical mutagenesis uh, with uh, irradiation which often generates small deletions, small bigger deletions. So such type of variation is uh, very common among in, in geneticists to produce uh, mutants and variants and then select uh, the kind of type. Uh, uh, the biological mutagenesis is uh, usually using uh, insertion elements. So the tDNA insertion, uh, the tDNA itself uh, after transformation can produce uh, mutants when uh, it's not interesting what is in the tDNA. The tDNA itself, which is a several thousand large insertion element, uh, if it is inserted to a gene, you can understand that it can make knockouts. Um, a variation of this when uh, reported genes are placed to the tDNA, and then uh, it's called gene trapping, then uh, reported genes are activated. Uh, both of them can generate knockout units. Uh, the reverse strategy is uh, so-called activation tagging when a uh, DNA has strong enhancers uh, activating uh, and they can activate the neighboring genes. So that is, in this case, uh, we, we look for so-called gain of function, gain of function type of phenotypes. And uh, one tool that we use extensively, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, when we make a seed in a library from a plant uh, uh, under the control of a strong promoter or regulated promoter, and this library is introduced by large-scale transformation to a mother plant or, or cell culture, and, and then uh, we can screen for certain type of phenotypes. So this genetic variation is the base of, of uh, studying uh, development, studying responses to to environmental effects and so on. Um, so how is, is a type of uh, genetic work, a mutagenesis work, um, which can be built up if we use, you know, we generate by, by mutant. So if uh, one of the common is the uh, etimatine sulfonate for Arabidopsis, and the, the seeds are usually mutagenized, and then the M2 generation is screened for certain type of phenotype in case of uh, stress, for example, uh, hypersensitivity to salt. Thinking that uh, if we look for sensitive plants, then uh, the mutated gene is important to. Uh, keep the plants alive in certain uh, of sort. And then uh, this plant, uh, seedling or plant can be identified and uh, rescued and then uh, analyzed uh, with genetic or more physical uh, and, uh, molecular way. Identification of such mutant, mutant genes was for quite a long time a, a, a very tough task because it has to be mapped and, and, uh, and today is a little bit easier but still it's not so not so fast and not so obvious in a number of cases. Uh, as an example for such strategies is uh, the identification of so-called SOS uh, genes in Arabidopsis which are responsible for uh, salt tolerance or at least part of uh, tolerance and uh, the source regulatory pathway was identified by 
thinning mutants for hypersensitivity and so on. Here you can see uh, Y type seedlings on, on, uh, in the presence of salt. The salt on mutant, you can see that it is uh, very sensitive, it's not growing. And if they complement the mutant with a, the identified source gene, uh, they resemble the Y type. So they show that, okay, this gene is responsible for this phenotype. Uh, apparently, this, the so called S1 protein is a, is a sodium uh, proton antiporter and it is responsible to expel uh, sodium ions from um, the cytoplasm. So, this is a very important uh, neutralization process. The SOS1 is actually induced by salt, but not with the uh, other type of stresses or abscisic acid. Uh, so, how this uh, ion transport and ion balance is controlled in the cells? So, what Jiang Kang Tzu's lab discovered is that SOS1, SOS2, SOS3, they are essential components of this different system. This SOS1 is a membrane protein, and as I told, it is eliminating sodium. In the absence of it needs actually a phosphorylation by a, 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 a kinase, which is called SOS2, but this is not functioning, uh, this phosphorylation, in the absence of source stress. So in the normal conditions, this, uh, this pathway is practically active. In the case of salt, uh, then there is a type of calcium sensor, in the sensor which is uh, releasing calcium, uh, the three uh, protein is a calcium binding protein. The, the scab B8 is also another calcium binding protein. And they activate uh, the SOS2 kinase, which is phosphorylating uh, SOS1 transporter and also NHX transport, transporter, which is uh, transferring sodium to the vacuole and uh, also APAs. So the SOS2 kinase is a very essential part because uh, it can facilitate a number of different uh, ion transporters and, and promoting the neutralization of the sodium. So that is, which has been uh, described first with the uh, genetics tools. And uh, the source pathway seems to be an essential part and it has been uh, Identify the first in, in Arabidopsis, but then they identify in all plants where they test it. So it's a very general mechanism for plants. Um, tDNA. Um, the tDNA insertions are usually generating knockout. So this is a little bit different um, tool with the ethylmethane sulfonate, but then it is easier, easy also to uh, identify the genes. So in this case, large scale transfer. Formation is used. Arabidopsis is the best. Generate transgenic plants and then uh, screen for a certain type of phenotype. And then the mutant isolation is, is uh, can be uh, easier with the tDNA. It can be also um, with the gene traps or or what is very common today um, that we use uh, databases in, uh, about insertion elements. And if we want to uh, identify an insertion or a mutation for a certain gene, especially in aromidopsis, then we can go to the databases and then we can uh, get from these uh, collections um, insertion mutants. Uh, practically all aromidopsis genes, they have one or more insertion elements identified. So this is the most common tool now for reverse genetics, and it, base, it is based on a large scale formation with tDNA vectors. Um, one example, we go reverse screening for salt hypersensitivity or tDNA insertion mutant collection, and we've identified a, a, a smaller mutant which was hypersensitive to abscisic acid for salt, for, so it was more sensitive to to different stresses. It 
turned out that a gene which was affected by this uh, insertion is a encoding a mitochondrial protein, and it is it was affecting uh, mitochondrial electron transport and respiration. And if we uh, overexpress this gene uh, in uh, uh, we, we could identify that uh, the gene product is is, uh, is uh, targeted to the mitochondria, and the plants, uh, the overexpressing plants, were somehow more resistant to uh, salinity. These curves are showing germination assays, and you can see that the transgenic plants are getting faster in the presence of uh, salt and or or high than the white type. So the insertion mutant was more sensitive, the overexpression plant are more resistant. This is not always the case, but this is uh, happening quite often. Another way to identify uh, new genes, what we used uh, in the last decade, this tool, is to generate uh, CDNA libraries. Uh, we first used uh, salt-treated Arabidopsis, but then some other plants also generated CDNA libraries in an expression vector, the control of a regulated promoter, uh, made large-scale transformation of Arabidopsis, and uh, screened for, for example, stress tolerance, high salt cosmetics, and uh, the plants what uh, could serve survive or could grow in such conditions, we pick them up and then could identify inside the gene very easily and clone them because uh, we knew what is the sequence of this expression concept. Uh, and then clone the gene, uh, analyze uh, this, this uh, identified line, and then uh, after cloning we could, could uh, verify the phenotype in independent transgenic lines or uh, Molecular characterization. So, in in such with using such uh, genetic tool, we identify a number of lines uh, and some genes, uh, which when they were over, they allow the plant to survive in such high salt in condition, in a, which was letter for white type plants. So here you can see an example: a small seedling is is growing while the, all the rest of the plants. Uh, and, and here we just uh, show that in uh, it's, uh, this is the white eye plant and the germination is not germinating in a, in a certain salt concentration and uh, several uh, uh, lines can, can do so they are more resistant. So in such way we identify the visual uh, factor with what we when we overexpress uh, it it uh, Converts the overexpressing plants to resistant to salt, more resistant. And this Hitchhop factor, uh, when we tagged with the YFP and uh, variant of, of GFP, uh, we could show that it is accumulating in, in a cell nuclei. And this Hitchhop factor, uh, when we overexpress, we could find that this the overexpressing plants uh, can survive better. Uh, high temperature uh, salt and combination of salt and high temperature because we, we were interested if combinations could be also um, tolerated by the plants. You can see uh, that the Y type and the two in, uh, uh, then transgenic lines in the salt, you can see that um, most of the plants are dying and they, most of them, they survive. And also in the combination of stress, these plants are surviving better than the wild type. And the oxidative damage is reduced in, in these transgen plants comparing to the wild type when they were exposed to salt or combination of salt and tea. So uh, we have much more data, but we, what we concluded that when uh, there is a <coughs> um, heat or salt stress, um, um, the plants usually accumulate uh, hydrogen peroxide, so that this oxidative stress is generated due to the accumulation of reactions, and this uh, hydrogen peroxide is activating 
also some signaling pathways, namely MEP kinases and uh, calcium dependent uh, pathways, and can stimulate uh, transcription of some target genes. Um, or this this feature factor A for A, what I mentioned, is a type is part of this signaling pathway. So we, we showed that MEP kinases can phosphorylate and activate this uh, uh, transcription factor, which in fact can uh, promote the expression of uh, some chaperone genes like heat shock proteins and other chaperones, or other transcription factors like that, and the weak type of transcription factors, which can proliferate more uh, this signal. So this is a part of uh, uh, this peroxide dependent uh, regulatory pathway. So, um, the plants respond to a number of different stresses in a, in a fairly uh, similar way. Uh, here, are, it is a very, very simplified scheme from a, a review, uh, but it's still uh, that it's, it shows well how is the response most important pathways in a arabidopsis, we call dicotyledonous plant, and rice, a typical monocotyledon uh, grass. So, if there is osmotic stress or cold stress, very similar genes and pathways are activated in, in this not uh, really not related plant. Abscisic acid is a central uh, hor stress hormone in both uh, dicots and monocots. And similar type of uh, transcription factors, this ABS type of transcription factors are phosphorylated by SNFK type kinase in both uh, organisms, and and, and uh, they uh, activate the target genes. And uh, in uh, abscisic acid independent pathways are existing in both species, for example, in abscisic uh, NAC and uh, or a type of factors are controlling this ABA independent path pathways, similarly in, grass, uh, in uh, rice, NAC type transcription factor. So, uh, and then uh, the cold uh, stress pathway is communicated by drep type uh, uh, transcription factors in both species. So, uh, this resembles that the causes in, in, in general in plants are conserved. Um, what is uh, different uh, slightly, although these responses are, are present in, in all plants, but uh, in some plants, they uh, some are added to, to a certain environment, others not. Uh, plants for uh, like salicornia or limonium or this lepidium I mentioned, they can if in certain environments where uh, uh, normal, not adapted glycophytic plants, not. They have also the same system and like, uh, and, and uh, rose detoxification system like other plants, but these systems are working in, in a more efficient way in, in this system. So we were interested to identify some genes in, from such halophytes and, and see if we can modify uh, a typical glycophyte like Arabidopsis. It's such genes. So this uh, um, CDNA transformation uh, system we adapted to a Lepidium crassifolium. This halophytic plants, the CDNA library was isolated from this, and we transferred uh, Lepidium genes to Arabidopsis uh, in a random way. I mean, it was. Uh, Tens of thousands of, of flies were generated. In this way, we screened on, on the salt and automatics and, uh, and paraquat oxidative conditions, and we identified several lepidium genes which could uh, confer tolerance to one or, or several such traits. Let me show you one example just shortly. We screened for paraquat uh, this transformed Arabidopsis population. And uh, paraquat is generating strong oxidative stress. It is used as a herbicide, although it is, I think it is already prohibited to use because it has some, some uh, harmful effects. 
but uh, it is very very efficient uh, uh, herbicide and in low concentration paraquat you can see that it is stop uh, uh, destroy the plants and in this particular line if we if we <coughs> introduce this uh, uh, this seed DNA, this they can and overexpress this seed DNA, they can they could grow in the presence of paraquat by uh, the right type not in, in fact we identified small uh, uh, seed DNA and a small protein in in this line which when we overexpressed in, in plants and in independently they could confer parapat uh, resistance to these plants. This is a more uh, type of uh, plasmic uh, protein. Um, what was interesting that the uh, overexpression of this small uh, protein, but we do small uh, parapat resistant protein, it was not really described in plants before. Um, uh, that it could confer resistant to uh, draw certain draw tolerance also to Arabidopsis. So, uh, for example, here you can see white up plants uh, sprayed by Paraquat. After a week, they they die. Uh, this overexpressing plants not. Uh, in the in the case of drought, the overexpressing plants could survive much better rate in the drought than white type plant. So here you can see uh, survival rates. In this gray is, is the white type and the uh, drug uh, was survived much better by the overexpressing plants. And uh, for example, uh, when we checked the several physiological parameters like electron transport rates, which were dropped by, in drought or paraquat uh, treatment in the white type and uh, Overexpressing plants, not so. This is just an example that uh, 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 small unknown proteins can be still uh, interesting and, and could be identified from some extremophile plants and can uh, convert to tolerance to certain type of stresses in, in, in non-resistant plants. I'm going to talk a little bit about proline, but not so much, which is. Uh, Another um, area of investigation for us, the proline uh, accumulation was discovered in the 50s. It's a very old uh, physiological paper, and this is the only amino acid which is accumulating during uh, osmotic stress, desiccation, salt, and such conditions. And what the proline is doing, uh, it is supposed to have an osmoprotectant effect on they, uh, some people describe uh, antioxidants or, or energy storage. It is actually uh, can have such features, but it's still not well known. But we know that uh, proline is, is uh, produced in uh, usually from glutamate in two steps in, uh, in the plant cells. Uh, and there are two genes, the P5CS1 and P5CS2, which are controlling uh, uh, this process. This is, uh, can be located in cytosol or in stress in chloroplast also. And uh, during stress, uh, salt or osmotic stress, growing is accumulating. And, uh, and uh, proline catabolism is taking place in the mitochondrium in, in stress. Uh, the catabolic pathway is, is blocked. Uh, in re recovery, during recovery, uh, uh, the catabolic pathway is activated, and biosynthesis is reduced, and the plant is oxidated in the mitochondria. So this is a type of circular pathway. And several other effects like light uh, is influencing. So we studied uh, the regular this pathway. We tagged the two P5CS genes with, with uh, green fluorescence protein and, and could uh, see where these proteins are accumulated in conditions and then uh, generated some overexpressing P5CS overexpressing plants. Uh, actually, um, before uh, this, uh, there was already some indication that the overexpression of uh, P5CS gene can uh, produce uh, more. Pro 
Pauline in, in, uh, in uh, transgenic plants and Indian scientist Kavi uh, Kishore uh, uh, from these experiments in, in uh, the 90s. It was a nice experiment that the overexpressing plant, tobacco plants produce much more proline than uh, the white eye plant, and they could survive uh, salt uh, much better than the white type. So, proline, uh, this protective effect of proline has been shown in, in these conditions. Now, we were interested in the, also in the regulation of these genes, and our work and some other people's work, we could identify some transcription factors <coughs> uh, which can bind to the promoter of the P5, the stress regulated and AVA regulated the P5CS gene. And uh, uh, we decided to study how is uh, uh, the promoter um, elements, what are kind of promoter elements are responsible for this transcription activation. So for that, we, we are using now genome editing, the CRISPR-Cas technology, which is a relatively new uh, technology. In such case, you probably know that uh, it uses site-specific nucleases, which you know, producing double-strand breaks, and uh, either uh, some re repair uh, Mechanisms with non-robust and joining generate mutagenesis. Uh, there is possibility to make homologous combination and uh, to generate point mutations or gene additions. So this uh, mechanism is, is now well documented. And what you need is uh, some vectors and design uh, a type of uh, uh, RNA coding. Uh, uh, guide RNA coding uh, sequence to target your uh, your genomic sequence, which is cut by this complex with the Cas9 uh, uh, endonuclease, and then this uh, double strand break is is repaired in in a different way, either just normally uh, be generating one or two. Uh, point mutations or larger deletions or even uh, exists this possibility to make this recombination. Um, so we use this technology, we generated uh, such uh, guide RNAs targeting these promoter elements and uh, after regenerating some plants, uh, uh, this, we, we targeted the G-box and some MIP-box in the promoter because they were conserved in a number of uh, related species and we try to make double strand uh, breaks at, at the point of this uh, cis regulatory elements and expecting that some point mutations will be generated after the repair mechanism. So uh, this is a, a case of uh, the G box which is CAC GTG, and then we could find several alterations in several lines, transgenic lines, uh, by sequencing these target genes where uh, extra G or T sequences, or some cases one or two deletions were generated. And in uh, in most of these lines, um, after abscisic acid treatment, the proline accumulation was inferior to the white type. So. This process is still uh, going on. In the, okay. okay, so <coughs> I am going to finish soon. Just summarizing a little bit uh, this this talk that, uh, uh, that controlling responses to aviatic stress is is a complex thing. So you can uh, you can uh, study in a different level. Usually you need a genetics to understand the functions of uh, regulatory genes or any other genes, which it needs uh, uh, transformation process, which needs usually uh, some genetic modifications. You can study it in the proteome level because there, there are signaling, uh, uh, different signaling pathways, including um, kinases, transcription factors, 
which actually control uh, the activity of some target genes. Uh, in fact, there are a number of cross-translational uh, modifications you need again, uh, proteome or transcriptome studies, um, um, or, or epigenetic regulation with, with uh, uh, histone or DNA methylation, which can make a feedback again uh, to the regulatory pathway. So this is a type of complicated stuff. Uh, this is still a, a, a simplified way. And then uh, one of uh, the less known uh, is, is the metabolome. What kind of metabolic changes are taking place? I showed you the proline as a accumulating amino acid, but there are large scale metabolome changes, which is a part of the response for for responding to stasis. Okay, how this knowledge can be used? Let's say in a, in a final words, what someone can uh, how someone can use to generate uh, perhaps more drought or so tolerant plant. It is not easy. Usually you need because this is a multi-gene process. So you can see that this is a lot of genes, a lot of levels, regulatory levels, which are implicated. So it's not just a question of one gene. Uh, usually, uh, um, strong basic research is needed to study certain phenomena, uh, identify certain genes, and then maybe you can design course or use the information for genome editing, for tilling, or transform to crops and test whether the effect of certain genes is really uh, such what you have observed in the lab. The, these genes can come from other plants, but can come from uh, extremophile plants, like I show you this uh, Lepidium classifolium. So, a few examples. Um, in, in this case, uh, uh, this people was using um, bacteria gene, so-called CSPB, which is a, a chaperone from uh, Bacillus uh, bacterium, and then they overexpressed in, and, and this can can uh, protect RNA, and they over overexpressed the first in Arabidopsis. They find that uh, this Arabidopsis in is uh, is surviving better in the cold treatment than uh, white type, and then they introduced the same into rice and uh, some other species. And they could, for example, show that the yield uh, in, in uh, that is expressing also in rice. Uh, they had to do some some uh, uh, modifications, but they could could uh, demonstrate that in s some arid regions, for example, in, uh, in maize or or in, in rice, also a cold heat or drought treatment comparing to the non-transformed white type. Uh, the yields were higher when they uh, overexpressed this, this CSPB protein and also in maize. So this led to the first commercial drought tolerant maize variety is expressing uh, CSPB uh, in, in maize on the control of uh, actin promoter, uh, rice actin promoter, and in case of drought they claim that in the field they have 10-20% uh, higher uh, yields than the traditional varieties. So it is not a question of life for that. But if, if uh, there are arid regions, uh, such small difference like 10% less yield loss or 20% yield loss is already a huge step. This is one of the examples that these strategies uh, genetic engineering can work. Uh, another example in which they used uh, genome editing, uh, it is known that uh, ethylene sensitivity is, is uh, important uh, to, in, in responses to uh, um, some stresses. In this case, they, they show that overexpression of uh, uh, a gene uh, could reduce ethylene sensitivity in Arabidopsis, so this was the basic research part it, it was um, demonstrated years ago. So uh, this group uh, uh, decided to replace uh, the native promoter in maize by a much stronger promoter 
using CRISPR-Cas general editing tool. So uh, this is original uh, gene with a promoter, original native promoter, and they use this uh, CRISPR-Cas system to in replace this promoter with a, a much stronger promoter to promote the expression of this uh, argo uh, s 8 gene and reduce methylene sensitivity. Uh, here there are uh, three transgenic lines, uh, three genome edited lines of Y type. In one genome edited line, nothing happened, but the other one, the expression levels in, in different leaves and different uh, tissues uh, were much higher. And uh, <coughs> the argo and this protein was was uh, much more expressed in in, in these lines, uh, in these general edited lines, and the yield uh, was slightly higher in arid conditions due to the change in in, uh, in uh, ethylene sensitivity. So this is what I tried to show you: some examples of our work, some examples of other work, other than published work showing that how certain genetic tools can be used and has been employed uh, to study uh, plant genes, identify genes and, uh, and characterize genes in which can uh, be important in, in uh, extreme conditions like this uh, winter condition in which I took some years ago in Hungary, but now it, is, it seems to be vulnerable. This year we didn't have such such winter, but who knows how these changes are going on. So this is what I wanted to sh show, and if there are some questions and I can respond, I'm happy to try to do it. Hello, audience. Uh, if anyone having the question uh, with, uh, with this uh, presentation from uh, Professor uh, Laszlo, then uh, please comment your question in a uh, comment box. Lassi, there was one question. Is that uh, is there such kind of an work going on in India? Do you know some group who are working on these lines? Well, in India, a number of people is working on, on, on salt and draw stress. I know uh, they use different tools. I, I, uh, people is using Arabic of mutants in quite routinely, but uh, I know what I know. Some people is is uh, trying um, to use uh, different genes to to get into different crops. Uh, for example, in Hyderabad, I know this professor Kavi Kishore, who who is uh, uh, using uh, different genes, including this uh, proline, uh, trying to make uh, proline over producing plants with some success. But he's he's using some other genes also, and and he's targeting different crops. Uh, I, I visited also Iquisa and they, they have very strong uh, programs with uh, different pulses and good transformation systems. So I don't know all the people because India is quite huge for publications. I, and in New Delhi also I, I, I know that some people are working in this. So there are a number of, of, of works, but um, it, is, it is quite complicated uh, stuff. So, so each each group or, or person has a probably different strategy, and which was will be more successful. It depends on uh, on, on uh, sometimes on the luck. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Laszlo. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Nitin Labhane, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Botany, Bhavans College, Andheri West, Mumbai to propose formal vote of thanks uh, for this session. Nitin. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pitambar. First, I like to, it's my privilege to have uh, been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Uh, this is the last session organized for the international webinar by the Botany for You uh, pl platform. So I am very much uh, thankful to uh, Dr. Pitamar Umne to who has given me the chance to speak. I, on behalf of organizing team of Botany for you, extend a hearty vote of thanks for the honorable delegates who blessed us with their presence and took out valuable time of uh, their busy schedule. I like to thank both the researchers. I think uh, Dr. Girish Kumar uh, Resineni and Professor Laszlo Shabados 
for sharing their wisdom with all of us on two different uh, aspects one was a live session and one was a pre recorded i think the all the participants had taken a uh, lot of uh, uh, insight from this talk i must mention our deep appreciation to professor lazo shabadosh and girish uh, resineni for their insight work which will give direction to all those who are viewing uh, who has viewed this talk today and who is going to view this talks in future as well because since it is on uh, youtube the this talk is now has become an history now everybody can watch it at any point of time so i think uh, professor lazo shabadosh and dr girish kumar resineni are the torch bearers to the people in life sciences like me and many more no words can express the feeling of gratitude towards accepting our invitation and giving a wonderful insight for the voyage of life sciences so thanks a lot uh, professor lazlo as well as dr girish now we'll, uh, now i will hand over the charge for further proceeding to our young dynamic and indefatigable dr pitti humne the founder of online platform botany for you for the learners of life sciences thank you very much over to you dr pitambar uh, thank you dr nitin uh, one more uh, instruction to the participants uh, kindly comment in every lecture delivered in this uh, national webinar right from the introductory remark to valedictory speech including the lecture delivered by dr girish kumar rasineni which is separately uploaded on our youtube channel your presence will be detected with these comments automatically and will be helpful to us to generate certificates so that every participant can get the certificates the feedback form link will be shared on telegram group kindly write your correct name that will appear on your certificate kindly co kind cooperation is solicited thank you very much for participation in this international webinar and uh, inauguration inaugural function of national teachers organization in life sciences uh, now i request uh, dr tushar vankhede sir who is an associate professor in department of botany sri shivaji college uh, sri shivaji science college amravati uh, to propose a vote of thanks to our uh, all the speakers of both the technical uh, uh, of all the technical sessions of both the days in this uh, international uh, webinar uh, dr tushar vankhede for a valid speech please Uh, dr tushar your mic is mute dr tushar your mic is mute uh, please unmute and then uh, uh, restart okay okay sorry good afternoon to everybody as per our uh, indian tradition it's uh, image of all our team members of botany for you express my sincere appreciation to all guest speakers teacher participants and the students on the occasion of inauguration of national teachers organization in life sciences friends this uh, two days international webinar was truly successful by the response of thousands of participants enthusiastically this venture also brought various corners of the world together and opened new avenues for the teachers students and other stakeholders the team of botany for you thankful to professor surendra singh institute of vocational studies rani durgavati university jabalpur for accepting our invitation and his courageous inaugural talk We are also thankful to Dr. Greg Rukert, founder and CEO of Allied Bulb Private Limited Australia, for enlightening new dimensions of the plant sciences. We are also thankful to Professor C. N. Khobra Gade, professor and head Department of Life Sciences, S. R. T. M. University, Nanded, for nice deliberations of the subject. Friends, our special thanks to Senior Professor Dr. Menon Daniel, ex head. the maharaja sajira university baroda vadodara for his blissful and informative supervisionary talk we are also thankful to dr jitendra gaikwad head biodiversity informatics unit german center for integrative biodiversity research germany for sharing novel concepts and fruitful guidance for the all of us 
we are also thankful to dr girish kumar rezini founder the chief scientific officer saipen hyderabad for excellent outlook of writing skills our special thanks to professor lazlo uh, sabdoz biological research center hungarian academy of science hungary for accepting our invitation and oblige us i am also thankful to all teachers participants from all over the india and abroad for showing their faith in us and our beloved students of life sciences across the world your presence and support boosted our morals and academics lastly i am thankful to the founder of botany for you dr pitambar hune for giving the chance also founder members of botany for you dr nishikant wasai dr nitin labhane dr deepak poche for shaping up all these events let us meet for our next venture soon thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh, dr kushar uh, one more uh, thing i would like to share with uh, all the participants uh, on uh, 15th august uh, we are going to launch our uh, website www.botanyforyou.com uh, so that every information which will be carried out uh, or every events which will be carried out in future that will be available on our website so from 15th of august you can uh, visit our website and uh, find out all the activities that we will carry, carry out through our online platform botany for you thank you very much for the participation and your always cooperation is solicited in all the events and plans uh, in a future by this platform thanks a lot